Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to play day number two for Badass University All Star Season Three. We kick things off so darn miraculously yesterday, but the show must always go on. We have got what nine weeks is it of nonstop action on Mondays and Tuesdays, as always, and there's no signs of stopping whatsoever. This time around. My name is Two Doors. Alongside me, I've got Whippet, and we are even going to be continuing week number one for you guys. And boy, oh boy, I am just so ready to get back on the horse. So am I. It, it seems like somewhat of a void. We didn't have a university siege the castle the last few weeks, and it's left an mm -hmm. empty place in my life. But I tell you what, we have an interesting yeah. matchup to start off. Play day two of week number one. And that's going to be Imperium of Mandem versus the Deviants. So Imperium of Mandem, a team name you should all recognize if you were following us closely in season two. They made it to that playoff stage, but they can never really make things ultimately click. They have great potential, but they never found that missing piece of the puzzle to make it all work. Can they do that now in season three? I believe they've had some roster changes they are going to be facing off against a new name that we've not seen so far. And that's the Deviants making their debut here in the University of Oscars. And I cannot wait to see how this goes. Because first time we're going to see a brand new team. Or at least I'm getting to see and cast a brand new team. Yeah, we, know we, had, yes, we had them actually work. Or some new teams making their debut yesterday. On our very first mm -hmm. opening play day. But I'm excited to see how this one goes. Yeah, as am I. Naturally, um, Imperium of Amandem is going to have, uh, it probably has seen quite a lot of roster shuffles compared to the old IOM that we, caught, that we actually got to cast last season as well. So I'm expecting a lot of fresh new faces. I'm, fre I'm expecting also some fresh new ideologies and overall gameplay style and whatever you want to call it is probably going to be an entirely different roster, not necessarily the actual faces on there, but the people and how they actually perform in the server as well. And the same thing can also be said for the Deviants as well. Now, personally, the Deviants, you know, I'm not necessarily the biggest fan of their overall team crest slash emblem, whatever you want to call it, though. I feel like it could have used a bit of work, but naturally I don't want to discourage the artist that made all of those things. It's cool, but it's not the greatest in my opinion. I mean, it's a tough competition. There's some awesome artwork going into all of these teams. Yeah. And some wonderful names as well. So, before we before we have to waffle any further, I think let's give some hint of what's to come further in the stream. As I believe we can have our map mm -hmm. vetoes for you, so we can find out where we're going to see our action for our opening game of the night. And, I mean, I don't know. I've kept myself spoiler free for these map bans, so this That's is going to be a yep. shock to myself. I really, I'm always going to hope it's going to be chalet, but we see coastline and clubhouse. I mean, waving goodbye to them in the very mm. first wave. And it's interesting to see Deviants pulling away Clubhouse, which is one of those crutch maps. And we're going to see them repeat that now as Oregon goes away. So pulling away two of those maps from the T4 trifecta. So Deviants perhaps trying to play a bit of an alt strategy, you know, disrupt the rhythm and not go to one of those maps that are super well oiled and well under understood as Cafe. They mm. pull that away. So they ban the entirety of the T4 trifecta as Villa is the last map standing. One of my old favorites. That's a map that many teams can bring different lights to when we're seeing somewhat of evolution right now of how teams like to play it. So interesting to what we have in store for this matchup. I was I was just about to say because after we saw the first four bands, I had my fingers crossed and I thought it was really really likely we go to Chalet because it was the last standing map that started with the letter C. But you know, we can't we can't we can't have everything in life. But regardless, Villa is going to be a really, really awesome place to start things off anyway. It has been a hot minute since I've actually casted Villa myself. So this is going to be relatively fun. Naturally, uh, it was the Deviants who had the final choice of opting where they would have wanted to actually direct this best of one to. And they naturally had the choice between either Cafe or Villa. Now, that is also something in and of itself really, really interesting that I think we could potentially dig a bit deeper into as to why they chose to ban out Cafe as opposed to Villa itself. Naturally, we don't know anything about the squad whatsoever. They could potentially be trying to throw a curveball or the roster itself may just sort of, well, be much more comfortable on Villa. We just don't know that yet. There's tons of different possibilities, but certainly for IOM, having seen them last week, or not last week, but I mean last season and the season beforehand as well. Well, we can obviously come to expect that they should be relatively well versed on a map such as Villa as well. Yep, certainly. So, and kind of touching on that point, you know, this is a new roster inside of Deviants. You know, no, we haven't seen them play yet. So, no VODs, no information on how this team will play. And, you know, they're going to a map that isn't that well regimented. It's not part of those yeah. three maps that a lot of te te people or a lot of teams tend to play. Mm -hmm. So, pulling them away you might be pulling out the lifelines for a team like Imperium of Man, them removing those easy maps that everyone should know. You know, you think about this Oregon, 
inside of competitive play, and even how you play it on a daily basis, isn't that w drastically different, at least on two core no. sites. It does change mm -hmm. when you go to alternate strategies and kind of the in-depth part of it does. But it's sure. a map that the defaults make a massive impact, and it can be very tricky and sluggish to fully kind of crack how it works. And you also have to mm -hmm. remember, Oregon now is going to be in a somewhat of a different shape. Cafe suffers from it too, as Flores is going to be available to play. And those RCXDs can be a nightmare to deal with. And yes, it does bump up that mute mozzie combination, but if you don't bring that, if you're not comfortable with those operators or your strategy just doesn't have them written into it, that Flores can really be disruptive if it's left on the field. So I am interested to see how this will play out. Yeah, as am I. Naturally, at the, um, in the higher tiers of Siege, specifically over towards EOL and NAL, because that's what we can currently sort of dig our teeth into. If I'm not mistaken, Flores has actually seen a really, really huge spike in overall ban rates as well, which is a bit ironic considering the fact that he is the newly introduced operator to the actual competitive scene after being out for two seasons. And for those of you guys that don't know exactly why he's such a potent operator in this current day and age, it's because of the fact that he's sort of filling in the exact same role as Ash, but he can do it just a bit better. Naturally, uh, Ash has kind of went back to the days of old where she only had two breaching rounds, and naturally you still have those three breaching charges as well, but because of the fact that you don't have the the rounds that you can that have like an infinite range and you can shoot them wherever the hell you want, uh, she's no longer as desirable whatsoever and teams have been actually deviating a lot towards Flores and picking up those Rotero drones as well and they've been working out almost fantastically and you know keep manning the drone for 12 seconds it's more than enough time to guide it to what the hell you actually want to blow up but a lot of teams have actually read into that as well and they ban out Flores just to sort of bring down the overall soft destructive potential on the side of the offense as well. So it's a very, very interesting dynamic that we see right now with Flores as well. I personally do hope that he's going to make it past the ban phase as well because it's just an absolute pleasure to see the Argentinian op uh, at every single occasion that we can. Uh, but we'll just have to wait and see. Naturally, we do have a couple of minutes before we can actually head into games. So... Keep your uh, keep your hats on Twitch chat. I'm pretty sure a prediction has also gone live, so you can go ahead and waste your channel points on whichever team you fancy. But that's about it for the time being, honestly. Well, I mean, we, we can look at our rosters, of course. We can see who we get to oh, watch true. up against. I forgot about that. And, and as is uh, a time old tradition, Tudor, I'm bad with names, so why don't you guide us through the gladiators that are entering the ring? Oh, we don't. You know, mm? we don't have a graphic oh. for. I just got informed, so I shall pull uh, up my list now. I shall look for it. You know, the one thing that I actually did want to ask is, um, if you're bad with names, then how the heck did you make it past kindergarten? Because obviously in kindergarten, the uh, and uh, specifically throughout elementary school, you always have to play those funky little games where you have to, like, memorize other person's name, and then you have singy songs that go with it. H how? How are you bad with names and you're Listen, also Listen, I, I just got time. lucky, but of course, thanks to the wonderful Wikipedia page that I, you know, helps, helps keep all up to date with all the things going on, I do have our rosters. So, for the Deviants, we have Spac, Magpie, Dom Free, Santanos, and TK, and then on the side of Imperium mm. of Mandem, Angelix, Ozzy, Scipio, Yukio, and NJS Saw. So, lots of names you can remember from last season. So, very strong roster on Imperium of Mandem. Keep your eye yeah. out for them. But Deviants, again, this is a team of players that, you know, Dom Free, Sandanos, I recognize them. They were really strong performers mm. in our previous season as well. So, there is some they talent were. here inside of Deviants. It's not going to be an easy showing mm. from Imperium of Mandem. So, I am looking no. forward to how this does shape up. And again, we went to mm. Villa. It's not a default map. They were all banned away no. by the Deviants. So, clearly, they've got something planned. Clearly they do. Clearly they do. And not, uh, I'm actually struggling to, uh, struggling to think when was the last time that I saw, not necessarily Imperium of Mandem play on Villa because the roster has seen quite a bit of shuffles, but when was the last time that I saw players such as Ange Angelic Scipio and, uh, and NSJ Sauce, aka Joe, play on Villa as well? Um, it, it has been a hot minute, and each and every single time that I'm trying to think of anything, I constantly think about the Oregon matchup that IOM played versus Coconut, Coconut, Coconut Cracked, um, that finished 8-6, to six, I think, in favor of IOM back then. I may need to refresh on that one, but my memory is starting to fail me of exactly what happened last season as well. All I remember was Angelix going absolutely massive and, like, bagging 21 kills by the end of that particular series, as well as getting, like, a lovely little... 
collateral headshot the stars align so perfectly i think that was in like round number 13 or something like that who knows but it feels so long <laughs> it's it, it season two feels so long ago it was it was maybe it what does. a month a month and a half ago and it, it, it truly does feel like a mm -hmm. lifetime ago but again for everyone yeah. joining the stream we're just you know, waiting for the final few confirmations so we can dive into the game but somewhat of a recap of the matches that we had yesterday of course on play day one our play days here mm -hmm. happen on mondays and tuesdays so we had three games yesterday and that was Veggie Patch versus Team Triton. Team Triton, of course, are defending champions, but they suffered a 7 3 loss. Lockdown Lutons faced off against the Combat Wombats, and well, they were able to find themselves a 7 4 victory. And Man, I Love Frogs versus Atlas, well, yet another 7 4 victory there for this time, Man, I Love Frogs. And looking at the team, uh, looking at the standings that I have up ahead of me, of course, on Liquipedia, keep go with that page, keep your eye on it, it gets every bit of information you want to track everything going on from yep. exactly when we're meant to be going live with our matches. So, team leading so far is the Veggie Patch. They are leading by a single round in round differential. Then we have Ludens, Manilo Frogs, and of course, well, that's how it sits right now. I'm looking forward to this because as we get into this, Imperial Man and them have a position where if they have a dominant start, our Deviants, the dominant start, they can leapfrog straight into the number one standing in the tables. And yes, it's only day one, but yeah. want, uh, you know, it's only day one, week one, but I, I still, I still want to, I think I, I want to put my money on Imperial Man and them having a strong run this season. Um, I think it's definitely possible. I think it's, uh, I think you're not in the wrong for actually wanting to back up IOM throughout this entire season, and I would as well. I'm, I really do love a lot of the faces that we have on that particular roster as well, and I'm pretty sure that they can bring the goods, but naturally, after talking with Rose, because he plays a lot with the boys as well, um, he plays a lot of Siege, Unranked, whatever that, whatever the heck you want to call it, he has taken a bit more of a laid-back stance towards actually playing the game, and he also can sort of attest to the boys also doing the exact same thing. But, hey, you know, they also did perform in Orbital. That was quite the story that we heard <laughs> yesterday as well. And they did manage to win out that particular grand final, if I'm not mistaken. It was like 2-0 or something by the time that the match was prematurely called off. So I'm pretty sure that if IOM can still perform in other rando T4 leagues, then they can do the exact same here as well. So mm -hmm. it's going to be something to definitely look uh, forward to. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, you, you say that, you know, you're mentioning that some of the people on the IOM have kind of mm -hmm. taken their time back, they've, you know, taken a little bit more time away from Siege and they're playing it yeah. more in a relaxed style. You've also got to consider a lot of... Uh, this, this is going to be my tangent, right? Because because I'm I'm one of the victims of this. Tarkov just wiped. There's a lot of crossover between Siege players and Tarkov. How many people? Yeah. I saw on Twitter a few of them have completely just went. I haven't played Siege in X number of weeks. Tarkov wiped. Now I've got to play this game. So we might be seeing it take mm. a few rounds for some of these players to get up to speed. But never mind. That's that's mm -hmm. that's my reference to Tarkov. I'm allowed one at least. <laughs> I haven't stopped playing it since it wiped. Help me, please. Now I'm just gonna let you suffer on your end of the screen. I'm just gonna let you <laughs> suffer in Tarkov. That's fine. Not my problem. <laughs> okay. I see how it is. Okay. Well, listen. At least, at least I'm not addicted to World of Warcraft. So. <laughs> hmm. I don't know. I don't know. I think. Uh, I think we're comparing apples and oranges here, or because we both have fallen prey to uh, to online video juegos. I guess it's just apples to apples. Who knows, really? I, I think. Which chat you decide for us. Yeah, they're the same thing, you know, it's... Alright, so, uh, we're just mm. waiting to, to get everyone in the lobby. It's, yeah, uh, not the first time we've had to do this. We are expert waiters, yeah. I can confirm. Uh, I don't actually have... I, I've lost my magical caster start game button. Have you found? Have you lost yours as well? Do mm -hmm. you have it available to you? I don't have it available. See, the thing is that I just had to bring it in for maintenance after Epic 33 oh, the last yeah. weekend. Yeah, exactly, and uh, we had uh, an extraordinary amount of delays throughout that entire tournament. Naturally, I was casting CSGO for the first time in, like, forever, which was really, really fun, but we had tons and tons of delays, and every single time Twitch chat, not naturally, they had the right to do this, they were constantly asking, you know, resident sleeper, casters, please start the game, what's going on? And I kept on telling them, like, yo, you know, I don't have the strength to press the caster start game button, it's... It, 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 it's it's an emotional commitment to have to start the game but naturally after i did actually click that button for my very very final cast of saturday evening which by the way was an eight hour cast that oh. i was working it was absolutely ridiculous i'm surprised that my voice has been able to hold recover up. since then hold up well, an eight hour cast the entire broadcast was 15 hours you so your match was 18 or eight hours not 18 eight 
Oh no, I wish. No, we, I had to cast three best of threes. Oh my. I, that mm -hmm. would have been... That sounds like it was a blast. How are you still standing after that? I would have... I probably would have collapsed of ripping my vocal cords out after one map. Or actually, I say one best of three. It's a good question. It's something that we probably have to leave the science to answer. Not the actual science's concept, but science our observer who's currently in our call as well, for those of you guys who aren't aware with the production <laughs> squad back here. Uh this is mm -hmm. this this is the wonderful one wonderful time. I, I've missed this. So I've had a a, a few yeah. a few I've had a few weeks off cast. Uh, and this is honestly sure. what I miss most, you know? It's not the, mm -hmm. the high intensity action. Not the shenanigans no. that you can get up to. No, no, no. It, it's it's mm -hmm. the waffle. It's the time that we have to spend filling in mm -hmm. as we wait for the uh, the lobby to get completed. And all I think of... um, I think we can actually start to give this an official name. I think from now on we can call this the pre-match podcast. How I how I wound it up in Peak's basement working as a caster. Uh, yeah, that it's is a very mean, interesting you story. Me, you dragged me into this basement that I am here now. You said Did it's, I? it's a comfy basement. It's a lovely basement. And then so And he's not wrong, we sleep in hammocks. That is true. I mean listen, this mm. basement was worth it because I tell you what, I had a crack in time on Saturday. That was a fun broadcast. <laughs> <laughs> that was a really, really fun broadcast. I was actually I was tuning in just here and there and naturally to get the whole Among Us mirror in as well because <laughs> I simply had to. I simply had to get that done, but I would have really wanted to just completely hang up from the opposing VMix call over by Epic 33 and just sort of, sort of dig right into the badass clash. Hopefully you guys in Twitch chat did also tune into that because it was quite the laugh. That was that was one of the one of the best times I ever had on a broadcast. And that Among mm. Us mirror, the clip, it's on our Twitter. Uh, go yeah. check out our socials, I believe they're down below. Oh, at BadassGG, I believe is the correct one. Don't, don't hold Underscore me. GG. Underscore GG. Thank you. You're here. Yes. You're here. You're here to save me for this. But got some good clips <laughs> of that clash. But you were the mastermind behind the Among Us mirror, I believe. It was I you. Was. You that on interview with Fastan made me go say, go check your DMs, on Someone's cooked up a strategy <laughs> worthy of your level of prowess, and mm -hmm. it was certainly a, a creation that came from your mind. I can tell you that. And the thing was that. Uh... Everybody already had already seen the actual Among Us mirror because I used it on the TL to respond to some other. I don't even remember what it was at this certain point. It was my. I'm gonna have tweet. to scroll. <laughs> it was yours. Okay, it yeah. was yours. So I now, yeah, I used it to respond to yours. So everybody already knew that it was underway, but nobody knew exactly that uh, that it would sort of like be brought out on 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 stream as well for a strap. But regardless, the waffle has. Ended, ladies and gentlemen. We'd like to thank you guys so much for tuning in to the Badass Pre-Show podcast. How we wound up in Peak's basement in just a few minutes, or technically like 90 seconds, give or take. We're going to be sticking with this particular matchup, IOM versus Deviants on Villa. So you don't, don't want to miss that whatsoever. If you came for the broadcast, then, or for the podcast, I should say, you're free to go. But trust me, you don't want to. Thatcher has been the first to fall, which honestly isn't all so surprising whatsoever. I am curious who we are going to see be banned out next on the attack. It could be a Flores, it could be either the Ash, it could be quite literally anything. Uh, this There's so many options. I think we're likely to see a hard breacher waving goodbye. It makes a lot of sense. Oh, right. Nope, it doesn't make ma. Okay, mm. okay, I, I huh. shouldn't even open my mouth. Bye, bye, Sledge. Oh, I mean, right, caster mode, let's try and justify it. Soft destruction and grenade. Things that are very important for an attacking side, so we pull that away. As mirror is next to go, and we won't be getting to see any of those, um, how do I, uh, soft mirrors that you are so fan, are uh, such a fan of. I don't think I was the only fan of the sus mirror. Everyone was everyone a fan, but I, I had to, it's your thing. I had, you know, I had to tee it up as your thing. <laughs> As Balak is the last to go. Bye, Balak. Yeah. So, I mean, pretty standard ban. I'm not seeing anything that's Besides like... the sledge, yeah. Yeah, no. I'd say, I'd say standard, yeah. I mean, listen, it just looks like they're not a big fan of SAS operators here, so we mm -mm. wave goodbye to two of those as we get into this. And for Villa, mm. again, I can't justify a sledge. I really, truly can't justify a sledge. I understand it was likely a target ban for someone. So, again, mm. Deviant seeing that someone on a IOM perhaps, you know, likes to use sledge a lot, are very comfortable in our 
pulling that away, it might make them uncomfortable, but have other options yeah. for self-destruction. And while we see that block being one of those options that you have, that you mm. can run that skeleton key, you can be able to you know, use that extra range. Not the biggest of loss, but we're going to see a six big way to that jackal, who does have a secondary shotgun, so can somewhat True. act as a pseudo soft destruction in that role. I was actually starting to think, how are the Deviants actually going to compensate for the lack of frag grenades that they have on their end? Because naturally, if Sledge was still available, then the only universe I would find ourselves in, where we'd be watching IOM and Deviants, is Devi Deviants always bringing out two pairs of frag grenades in the hands of the Yana and in that of the Sledge as well. And naturally, I started to think to myself, like, they could potentially bring out a Maverick to make up for those lost frag grenades. They could potentially, I don't know... Heck, even bring out a Nook. Really, there's a lot of different operators that have frag grenades in their back pockets that could be utilized, but Deviants actually are only going to make do with the single pair, which may be rough. To a certain extent, it's going to be much more difficult for them to actually land those frag grenades right on the money, considering the fact that IOM have got two catchers at their disposal. Naturally, we've got Hench on the Jaeger as well as Dob playing on the Wamai. So... We're going to slowly but surely kind of, you know, inch our way back to the 22nd meadow where Util is going to be dumped left, right, and center before Deviants can actually find an opening. But speaking of an opening, Scipio might actually be offering himself up, or at the very least, he doesn't. Spots out the Gemini Replicator and now has the opportunity to fall back. Looking at the operator lineup and setup that we've seen IOM bring, and that mute mozzie is something that I would keep your eye on, because you're going to see a lot of it in our current climate. Flores is very strongly countered by these two operators, and again, a good strong kit, forcing information to be a true premium, as Scipio's on this roam is going to be relying on that information being hard to find in a rarity, so takes a little bit of damage, but trades it off to Magpie, his return fire is there, but Sundanos finds the opening kill of the map drop as well. Machine Fall is now making us a 4 versus 5 in favor of the attack by the Deviants. Control and map control beginning to fall in their favor. And looks like they're going to be reasonably uncontested. They do have that active threat of a C4 down below, so that's going to be what that Mozzie is trying to work with. I imagine it does yeah. seem that something at least happened towards that bench, and I believe that was a C4 already used away. So, and well, looking at that, yeah, Scipio doesn't have that in pocket anymore. So, that's mm -hmm. the chance, that chance for a retake from down below with that damage done longer an option so we're going to use their gun skill and positioning alone to be able to scrap this one back to level playing field hmm lucky for them a lot of the players on the side of deviants they're they are already quite softened up so just a couple of well-placed rounds from any one of the smgs or heck even yukio c4 right over here could net them a frag but i don't believe that was oh that was toss out right here and ugh. Bit rough, Sundanos was just out of its oh. AoE, but guess what? Kovac, he waltzes right into Yukio's LOS, and just like that, Magpie actually goes in for the trade, but he's going to be deterred. Yukio is able to spray him down ever so slightly into 25 HP, but then again, he's able to find Scipio, I believe, elsewhere on the map, potentially inside of the B-bomb site as well, and just like that, Deviants, they have now claimed control of 90. So, Selma's likely to be tossed out, but they have to do it quickly as the Dob, he's currently ascending the red staircase. Yukio perfectly finds that of Dumfries, but Spack already read into the rotate that the Dob was trying to exhibit. Now, it's a 2v3 scenario, the calm before the storm, 35 seconds left, and IOM, they've got to hold on. On. Yeah, well, it's going to be the critical phase. Concussion is tossed out now, and the engrossing pressure down towards classical hallway is there. That jackal looks to be the key to trying to pick this lock, but Hench darts back inside of all as Yukio stands up to take the front line. The brunt of this fight, no C4 to work with, and both defenders now cornered backs against the wall. The cross is free for this plant, but no one's taking the prime opportunity. This timer hits red, so we're in critical. A flash buying out to deter anyone. And well, Hench has got a really easy swing opportunity. The cover is there, but a pre-fire might be all he needs. I can't land oh. the shot, and so the Nomad pops up just in time. It's all down to Yukio, but that's Magpie inside of the bar to wipe things up and get the opening round inside the Deviants. And from the outset of that round, it came down to trades. Every time Imperium of Mandem would fire up, find a kill, while well, Deviants, they were in that perfect three-second window, instantly mm -hmm. retorted, got themselves that kill, and maintained their player advantage all throughout the round, positioned themselves perfectly with cover and crossfire for execution. And well, for an AVG attack, you could not have asked for a cleaner execution.
No, not at all whatsoever. And I'm pretty sure Deviants actually didn't even have the opportunity to open up 90 with, um, or the Vault Wall, I should say, with those Selmas, because I'm pretty sure there was a Mute Jammer on it as well. And I, I'm sorry, I, I'm pretty sure we are having a Mute uh, Sound Bug, so that's probably why we are going to be rehosting the lobby. But I just read in the all chat, well, my Sound Bug. There's a well, my Sound Bug now as well on top of a what? Mute Sound Bug. When did that happen? Well, I, I, I don't know. I, I, my, uh, my eyes might be deceiving me, but I'm pretty sure I saw well, my sound bug in all chat right there. Yeah, I, I also did see it. So it, it looks mm. like we, we're just going to be pausing, getting everything set up and reestablished yeah. for this. And that opening round, to take as much of that out as we can, again, it's one round in isolation mm. doesn't tell a lot about the story of this matchup. So we no, can take doesn't. everything we say with a pretty large pinch of salt until we see how at least the next Two rounds play out but that Fair. Rome presence yeah. fell back and was somewhat defeated pretty quickly from the side of deviants and ever since mm -hmm. they got that opening kill they pressed their advantage and stayed pretty much in the ideal three second window to get those trades when ION would swing around a corner and find one kill back and that's a really mm -hmm. good identity you have as a team to be able to retort rebuttal whenever you lose them or take a casualty to find one of your own yeah. So, again, a good start from them showing they have that coordination. They know at least the core fundamentals of attacking a map like mm -hmm. this. And considering their choice to come here, you'd hope they would be able to take it as, you know, well, yes, best of one. It's not technically someone's map, but they got the last ban and they chose to mm -hmm. get here. So, they're looking yeah. strong so far. They really, really are, and obviously to touch on and to sort of add on to what you were talking about, the fact that Deviants were always able to maintain their main advantage, that is more often than not a really, really rare commodity to actually have as a team, and I'm starting to think... Hmm, I'm trying to think. It reminds me of one of the mad, the last matches that I had casted for the second session of EU Challenger League, and I remember seeing Makers play against one of the teams from the Benelux region. I'm pretty sure it was Team... I don't think it was Team 7AM, or it might have been. I have to... I'll probably have to double check that as well, but... I remember Makers being an absolutely ruthless squad, and regardless as to how, uh, how, uh, like how, uh, how much Team Seven AM actually tried to keep them on their toes, it felt as if Makers were almost one step ahead of them. Now we're obviously comparing two different calibers in overall refract potential. With that being Makers, the SI Grand Finalists and the PG Nats winners and the Challenger League qualifiers to well, Makers what, didn't huh? make the SI Grand Final. Not grand final, I meant S. Oh, main did I say grand final? Yeah, you said main stages. Yeah, main stage. They made it playoff. They made it to playoff. It was, it was Liquid versus Nip. You were in the call. You were at the watch party. I know. I was there. Howdy. Okay. You Come know on. We'll brush past this. We'll brush past this. I don't want to. I don't want to no, upset no, you too no, much. Shaking my head. My head is. We're not gonna focus on this right no, now. No, That's, no, no. Uh, we're we're, but mm -hmm. we're back. We're back to the podcast stage at this section. So uh, we, we gotta fill somehow. How? Well, two podcasts in a single day, this is not something that you get all too often, so you know what, Twitch chat, consider this one a treat just right for you. Um, naturally, we uh, we do want to hop into the, game, uh, into the game as soon as possible, but you know, that's a problem for uh, future tutors and future Whippet to deal with. For now, you have us and we're busy with the podcast, so uh, I'm sorry, uh, what was on the script? What, 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 what should we be covering right now? I completely forgot. Uh, I've left my... Mm. Yeah. Uh, Are those not stapled together? No, uh, I see. I, I don't get the premium script package. Uh, I, I get loose pages in the post every week. So I, it's. I don't oh, know what and they're order not even they're ordered? In. Yeah, they're not even uh, ordered. So, like, I don't. This says somewhere along the lines is joke about two doors guinea pig. I mean, was that meant to be in, in the first section or are this re host? I, I don't, know. Hmm. I don't know. I'm anymore. pretty sure joking about my guinea pigs usually comes on during the introductions. It's like one of the it's like one of the best icebreakers for a broadcast to make fun of the other person whilst introducing them. But since I take the lead each and every single time, that that's impossible. That is true. I mean, not I. I have. I think it's a rare occasion, but I have introduced the mm. stream while co-casting with you. So it's not a hundred percent. Yeah, once. Still bad. Maybe twice, but. Twice is like the max that I've ever seen it happen. Yeah, I mean, I mean, mm. it's not my style. I, there's too much pressure to opening up a broadcast. You got to think about it, right? It's nope. the first impression matters. So you can just imagine how terrified I was on Saturday, and I was like, I think I was like, Lonnie, please, Lon please, 
please do the intro so you don't have to make me do it and I think it worked out pretty well. We're gonna boost that confidence a little bit. The next couple of casts that we have together, no, you're no. taking lead. Yeah. How yep, dare you? Yep. How dare you? Mm. Do that? I will. I... <laughs> Sorry, I, I I can't say it on broadcast. <laughs> but uh, you 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 uh, I, I listen. This this is the point where yeah we don't have a lot of material at this stage of the season to walk. We don't have you know a backlog of games. We have three games we could talk about. Wow, we have you know three stat lines to bring up from the matches that we've already had. So, so that's it. You've already decided to completely render the script of unordered pages entirely useless. Well, okay, All right. We can talk yeah. about the games that we had yesterday a little bit yeah, more. We can. Because yeah, we can. We can talk them. We can. Talk we can about pull up. I can bit. pull up a very brief bit of stats. So, I mean, our first game yesterday was in Oregon. Thank, you know, thankfully I wasn't on that because I would have been sad if I had to cast Oregon for the opening day. day but Same. I will say this, Triton bond out of Flores makes a lot of sense. But, but later down we had when Atlas, who on Oregon as well, didn't ban out Atlas, or Flores. So teams having a different philosophy. But I did just get a whisper in her ear that we don't have yes. to find something to waffle that anymore because we're back! <laughs> we're back in the game! Yes! Indeed, we are so we're going to be picking things right back from where we left them with deviant being one round up on the attack it was a very very strong showing to kick off villa that we saw on their side but naturally now on the side of iom they're gonna to have to dig a little bit deeper or potentially just sort of well switch things up you know variety is the spice of life and as such, they're not going to be revisiting AVG. If that were to be the case, though, maybe in an alternate universe they would have revisited AVG. I would have been wagging my finger no at them because I personally really hate AVG as a bomb site because of the fact that it is just very difficult to win on the defender side in this current climate as well. So it's not that wise to actually visit the bomb site anymore compared to, well, three years ago back in Parabellum. So good on the side of Iom for realizing that it may not be may no longer be a viable option and just actually you know pick us or at the very least attempting to pick up rounds elsewhere. To somewhat touch back on what you're saying, AVG is really to me and, and kind of you know, I'm in this perspective where I get to see a lot of games and from my casting perspective, but I have seen it fall off in terms of success rate pretty significantly. And at least mm -hmm. in the rounds that the defense win it, it's never that convincing. It's always something. No, it's always so close. It yeah. is so close. It comes down to usually uh, very, very tight 1vxs, whether it be a 1v1 or a 2v1, where the defense are actually finally able to close it out in their favor. Uh, by no stretch of the, uh, by no stretch of the imagination does the defense, quote unquote, win EVG convincingly anymore. And I mean, that's an intro. It really is a somewhat of a suffering of the edge of the map because it's what three years old now. AVG has been the primary site for a, a majority of those years, and I think all three of those years we've not really seen it slip out of that status just yet. We've been seeing teams flirting with the idea of using downstairs as primary recently. Scipio looks to get aggressive, follows those tracers around the opening breach, but can't find anything. Does find that Gemini replicator sending it down the main stairs, and that's going to be raving the wet red flag. Now they know they have an active threat down below, and that's going to be a C4. They'll have to worry about the Jackal, though, doing good work, being able to get that mm. ping. So Magpie has a position identified on that Mozzie. As Scipio runs away, and that ping's just a little bit delayed. So no damage will be done. We see that Mozzie's already scampered off well into the sunset. As some shots get sent down range. No extension towards Aviator Games from the Imperium of Mandem. Deciding yeah. to fall back a little bit and looking at their operator positioning. They're pretty, you know, pushed back into the deep side of map right now. They're giving a lot of control up for free. And, well, you've got a minute and 40 left to work with. You've got a C4 down below, yes. But look at this map control. It's forfeit. Uh -oh. There's your C4. It's gone. And now it's all down the winning gunfights. And, yes, you have the best position. You have your two to help you. But even then, every gunfight can technically be a 50-50 gamble. And that's a risk that some teams are. That's a risk you really shouldn't want to take. Especially this early on. If we were, for example, six rounds down the road, I would probably say, yep, go for high-risk, high-reward plays, but now it's simply not necessary on the side of IOM. They can still let their utility do the majority part of the talking because, keep in mind, they only exhausted one out of four C4s. They still have three in their back pockets as Henshin is able to actually pick up Kovac, being the opening frag on the side of Deviant. So that's already two frag grenades effectively flushed down the drain as Deviant. They're trying to crumble on this particular defensive setup from all... 
areas available. Magpie is able to find one. Scipio is going to clean one up on Sandanus, as I believe. Maybe shutting him down mid-grapple? Unknown. But regardless, Magpie is able to find their second onto Hench as well. Scipio being the sole survivor inside a closet. He's the next to fall at the hands of Dumfries. And that leaves us in a 2v3 scenario. 30 seconds left in Deviant. They're starting to control the bomb site inch by inch, but Magpie's the next to fall. Lovely retrade comes out from SPAC. And just like that, the defuse, it can start going down. Dumfries providing coverage while the Dob is trying to waltz his way on in. But they haven't read his rotate just yet. He catches a glimpse of the Selma and he can use it to his advantage, but he'd rather just do it the good old-fashioned traditional way inches away from creeping up and he's able to shut down Dumfries this is now a 1v1 but no it's turned into a 1v none as SPAC had the information readily at his fingertips to get that trade on in and just like that deviant they're able to maintain their win streak two rounds back to back yet again a strong entryway and they were essentially given map control for free a period of man then put up no significant fight to hold on to study an AVG and when you give away that much map control so freely and so quickly, you're inviting pressure on your, upon yourself, and you're inviting that execution to eventually arrive. So, well done the Deviant there, taking full advantage of every inch they were given. And for Imperial Man them, perhaps it's time to extend your roam strategy, bring something new, and well, the Dob's going to try and bring something new with the Canadian Operator, and that Fog map making their very first appearance. But no, I speak too soon as well, my is being brought out. Mm. Don't right now for the Deviants, and they're making a pretty impressive statement on their first outing here for the University All-Stars. So, Aviator Games, we return second time of asking for IOM. Can they make it stick? Otherwise, in terms of lineup, it's not significantly changed, but I will say this, Scipio's mm -mm. rocking that wonderful team secret skin. I have to say, that's a locker of skin. It's quite gorgeous. Just, uh, admire it, Twitch chat. All you really can do. I personally haven't actually picked it up. I don't think I've actually bought any of the skins from this new drop. drop. Uh, I think I, I yeah. think I bought quite a few to be fair. Naturally, I bought the Dark Zero one with, uh, but with hindsight, maybe I should have, I shouldn't have done that. Uh, which I'm, sh I'm struggling to think which other ones I actually managed to pick up. Memory fails me right now, but when does it not? Hmm. Uh. I don't know. My, my my memory has been fleeting. It is uh, truly betraying me at this stage. So, did you see an entryway? It's going to be another push from the main bedroom. Try and get that control. Clear the northern side of the building. And it looks like very similar positions or defensive fortifications being applied. Yukio playing more aggressive in the bathroom. And, well, this is going to be a machine holding a very similar angle. They're facing down towards walk-in. But again, you're looking at this. You're seeing this. This is exactly what they've done last time out. And Davian didn't really care too much. They got the information. They took their fights. And they won them. So... Imperial Man then perhaps play more passive and try and drown out that clock and really burn every valuable second they can. Now that might make it a more difficult task for Deviant to start cracking through this defensive strategy. Down below, Hench does have that C4 threat, but information has to be spot on in order to get that C4 to work effectively. And doesn't appear anyone's going to be able to give accurate callouts right now, so Nomad makes an entryway inside a bathroom and essentially has Astro cleared and free already. As his Rome presence, well, it's for the most part falling back and I think it's right on time as well we're about 80 seconds into the match as well and IOM they've already done their tad bit of scrimming they have already well shot out quite a couple of drones as well on the side of deviants if I'm not mistaken they've got what roughly five of them left at their disposal including uh, the Gemini replicators on the side of Kovac as well. So Iom have already been able to shut down quite a bit of, it, a bit of information, but Yukio dancing with the devil is uh, finally going to get called back to the locker rooms as he's the first frag on the side of Deviant. Now currently 5v4, and unironically, we find ourselves in the exact same situation as round number one with Iom being a single person down and always having to fight from the back foot. It's a really, really tricky round to win out, considering the fact that Deviant have been absolutely ruthless on confirming their trades and hench. Well, he's no exception this time around. He's going to get spot out mid-rotate uh, rotated as he's trying to retreat back on towards the bomb site, caught through the hatch as well, and that leaves Ioman in an even worse position. Now Deviant, they can start getting that Selma breach open over by 90, so they can effectively cut down the bomb site in half once again. 
rendering one of the prime positions entirely null on the side of IOM. This is a rough position for the defense. Yeah, and with, well, 30, 25 seconds left to work with, only two members remaining, it's going to be an uphill battle, a fight for every inch of control they can. The Dob's going to fire back and find one, but as every inch begins to fall, every cover compromised, oh. he goes down behind the bar, and not so happy hour for him as 10 seconds remain as Cute Machine finds yet another kill, but with three more to go and the fuse are not quite down yet, perhaps that could be a lifeline, but we're three seconds away from entering mission critical. The angle's held from behind the couch, but doesn't matter as the ARX sings and very rapidly sends a body six feet under as yet again Deviant find another successful attacking round here on Villa and for remembering this is a historically a very defender sided map it has begun this shift a little bit more neutral in recent times but still a 3-0 lead is a pretty demanding one and commanding respect is Deviant right now as trophy statue brought out yet again by IOM Deviant have been absolutely on point thus far, at the very least, it feels like it when it comes to them dealing with the roam presence, but I'm not exactly sure if it's being done on purpose or if it's simply IOM kind of off offering up their, def uh, like their defenders, but unknowingly. We saw, for example, Yukio in that past round, right here. He was shooting for- he was going for drones. He was at the top of the red staircase just trying to catch- well, some deny Deviant some intel, and he got punished for doing so as well. And that really does beg the question, IOM, it's happening with a situational awareness more often than not, because they're losing players in situations where they clearly shouldn't. Specifically just like that, that was a freebie on the side of Deviant, and they will take that any day of the week. So now on the side of IOM, I'm pretty sure that playing this a tad bit more conservative, uh, conservatively is the right call. But not only that, it's also recognizing when to engage certain events that are transpiring on the map and when to simply back off and try to keep yourself an unknown factor. It's a really, really interesting dynamic, and it's a very difficult one to actually strike a proper balance in playing as a defender, in my opinion. I really couldn't agree more. You have to know when to stick and play your life, play your position till the bitter end and drown out that clock and make this round go to deep water. But sometimes retreating, falling back and becoming that elusive element for your team is the right call. I will say the addition of an Oryx and clearly seeing the hatches intending of roaming has rotations established and has those hatches open. So freedom of movement is something that Oryx is very good with. And the vault in from that Gemini replicator doesn't last long. Cheap machine sends that one to the shadow realm but it's only a hologram at the end of the day so information gained at no cost to even the drone economy a good setup with that Surya shield protecting that goyo shield but burnt away rather rapidly uh -oh. and well not for long it's that selma charge used to cook it away and oh, only can't nearly. remove it from play so that goyo shield now null and void no longer a factor in this round and with two minutes remaining that's the first significant bit of utility cleared away it was actually a really, really unnecessary risk that Deviant took. First, exhausting one frag grenade to then get rid of the Vulcan shield with a Selma charge. You could have done it vice versa, because you can't actually destroy a frag grenade with bullets. Surprise, surprise. I wonder when uh, Ubisoft are going to include that particular feature, but I suspect it's a ways down the road regardless. Deviant, they've already been able to, quote-unquote, establish a beachhead for themselves inside of Closet and Masters sooner rather than later. That's going to actually be confirmed information towards them, and they're looking to now challenge the player inside of Astro as they have Dumfries currently inside <laughs> a bathroom, who's now just down gone. A wonderful C4 on the side of Cute Machine, and I believe that was through the triple as well. And you can see Dumfries, well, he can't be mad either. That was a wonderful toss as well for IOM to nab themselves the man advantage for what feels like the first time thus far on Villa. Well, Sandano tries to creep up the the, black, the back stairs here, and well, finds the dob napping. That breaching charge isn't exactly discreet, so I'm wondering if the bandit wasn't just that keen on hearing. With 50 seconds remaining and a 4 versus 4, this is going to come down to a bare knuckle brawl, and the first fight we're seeing line up is going to be between Kovac and Yukio, in a great position with the SMG, and swings Ooh. out, follows the tracers round, nearly finds a second, and does so! As Spock falls in the DBNO, looks for a third, nearly finds it, oh, Yukio pop off, a three-piece, looks for one more, but that's the round done, damage has been caused, and with 20 seconds remaining, and a fuse or no man's land, it's up to Cute Machine to close it out with the Kector.
Absolutely masterful stuff on the side of Yukio. Hasn't necessarily been popping off throughout this entire matchup thus far, but that was one of the best plays that I have seen thus far, and actually in quite a while as well on the side of Badass as a whole platform as well. So, whew. It's really, really good that Yuki was the sole person that was actually able to step up to the plate when it was so desperately needed, but at the exact same time, I don't even think it was needed. You could argue that in a good old-fashioned Mexican standoff, well, a 4v4 scenario could have definitely been win be winnable for IOM, but you know what? Yukio, I see you wanting to grab extra style points and just actually strike some fear into the hearts of Deviant. I can definitely agree with that in every single regard. That first peak was absolutely disgusting and naturally it is a bit of a well-played position as well on the side of the defense so the fact that Deviant didn't actually clear out that corner it simply worked into Yukio's advantage and from that point onward well the pepperoni in the right hands is quite the lethal weapon and Yukio has just proved that to us exhibit a b and c IOM they've finally been able to pick up their first round and now Villa starting to get a tad bit more competitive but can IOM close the gap between it before halftime strolls around that's going to be the main question we have to ask ourselves well being able to find one round back can often be the spark of a comeback so Imperial of Man them have they spark that level of rebellion and can they find two more rounds back to back to get themselves back to a level playing field Looks like Yukio is building off that momentum and tries for a long range spawn peak. Taps away as Dumfries takes around 30 HP worth of damage. Luckily, it was that Pepper only, so we're not going to do a significant amount of damage sending 9 milli down range like that. But nonetheless, the progression begins, and this is going to be yet another similar take, pushing in towards Master Bedroom. But after yeah. a play like that, after a massive three piece from an individual performance, at least on Yukio, I think the team are going to play with a level of confidence and might just take these fights more willingly now, as they know that they can win these direct engagements. But once again, this Rome presence somewhat hampered early as they fall in deep back towards the bench hallway and from this position you can't do a lot of defending you need to be a little bit more direct and it looks like Yukio is going to be trying taking that front line position and cause some chaos so we hit that two minute mark in the round one thing that I've actually picked up on that is really, really strange on the side of IOM, they don't really commit a lot of reinforcements towards their overextension into, um, for example, Trophy when they're defending AVG or vice versa. And it's a bit strange as to why they oh. don't want to do that. But this time around, you know what? Hell, just go ahead and have fun. Yukio is able to find the first. Cute is going to chime in with one of their own. And that leaves us in a 5v3. The perfect, utter, simultaneous collapse has left the Deviant in a 5v3 scenario with Magpie also on desperately low HP. So, this round is already starting to draw itself much closer to an end before it even got the chance to actually pick itself right on off. Dumfries is now left in the DBNO and cleaned up promptly on the side of Cute, who has been having an absolute field day thus far. One of the highest fraggers in the server, which is, well, a bit surprising, but you know what? Cute continue to cause chaos because it appears to be what you are best at for the time being. Picked up back to 20 HP means that they can still have an impact as the daub is down below creeping and crawling his way potentially for a nice little flank or just waiting for Deviant to make their first move. Now Magpie on 1 HP. Oh boy, this is rough for him. <laughs> yeah, Magpie is somewhat going to be walking into a trap. Multiple angles can face him down and while well, we see that Jaeger just inches away in the opposite connecting room. Dob goes on a flank down towards Astros, so I don't think the Spanish attacker has too long left to live. Is their position known mm -hmm. and compromised? And, well, Spack is certainly on the hunt. I'm oh, sorry, my bad, Spack is their teammate. I, I, I'm listen, my eyes just saved me. I thought it was Jaeger. Don't worry about it. But there's Yukio popping off again. And that confidence, that level supreme, is just really showing now. As for 20 seconds remaining, it's all down to, well, Ugh. two Spack. And, well, Yukio doesn't take prisoners anymore. They've seemingly woken up, and that's going to be a wonderful shot to get this round closed up. Two in a row for IOM. One away from tying up this opening split. And, well, if momentum is anything to go by inside of Siege, they certainly have it now. As Dining and Kitchen makes its very first appearance on this map. And, well, I'm figuring if man them have to go here now. As their two other primary sites locked out due to success. So, can it Deviant yeah. break down this tertiary site and find themselves leading the half? Their defense split with an advantage? Or will IOM find the reset button to get us back to level playing field in round number six? Hmm. 
Honestly, I want to say that IOM are probably going to take this third round just because of the fact that they have built up so much momentum in the last two rounds that the results have only been getting better and better. If we take a look at that last round, what exactly happened? Well, I'll tell you, it was Cute and Yukio. They were able to keep the attackers at bait so much to the point that the actual anchors of Scipio and Hench as well as the Dob really didn't even have to well contribute to that round whatsoever. They just let Yukio and, Mach and Cute Machine do all the talking. And you know what? I'm A-OK -okay with that. It shows us that you've got a really, really strong roam game that is difficult to deal with. But now, I think like we're actually going to get a different side of that entirely. Because this is one of the only bomb sites that actually forces you to clean control of that top floor. And it also requires a team to, well, basically take a much more different stance as opposed to just running laps around the rolling hills of Tuscany. So... <laughs> On the side of Deviant, well, you can de you can definitely tell that they've got the tools for the job. I believe their lineup in terms of, well, operator composition has actually remained relatively constant throughout this entire matchup thus far. And Buck is going to be one of the most crucial operators in this scenario, and it's going to be in IOM's best interest to remove the Canadian op from play as soon as humanly possible. But naturally, Deviant, their eyes are peeled over towards that top floor. So that's where they're looking to establish their beachhead as Kovac sends in the first Gemini Replicator. Info has already been gathered. There's a player inside of Statuary that must be dealt with before Magpie can let that Skeleton Key sing. I've never heard the Skeleton Key sing, well perhaps its chorus is more bellowing than the Alder. As we hear those Selmas rattle off in the distance, chewing open that wall and reducing the playable space to the defense rather significantly. But Cute Machine seemingly doesn't care, stays aggressive, but perhaps regrets that decision as they're left in the afterlife. G36C leaves no prisoners and... Well, that Banshee sings off in the distance, but that Yana just don't care. Yukio lobs up a C4, but to no avail. Yukio, mm. we've seen the damage they can do with a 9mm rifle or 9mm SMG in their hands, and this time they've upgraded the HK MP5. So, what work can they do with that? As it all plays around these pantry stairs, looming with that AUG primed and ready. As an nasty angle up that hatch might be a massive deterrent for anyone that push deep instead of Astro. Funnily enough, that was actually uh, one of Mozzie's pests that was able to take the drone, hence the blue light itself. But more importantly, back to actual matters as opposed to, well, pointing out this game's obscure details. Yukio is able to find SPAC. So, we're back in an even playing field as things currently stand right now. And Deviant, they're starting to get themselves a much more firmer grasp, not necessarily of the bomb site, but all of the real estate that is currently above it. And they're looking to make their next move. But they do also have to realize sooner rather than later that IOM are actually remaining extraordinarily mobile. They're trying to keep Deviant on their toes as much as humanly possible. And thanks to the fact that Jackal is available, that job has been made so much easier. Scipio down below on the red staircase duels it out and is able to one tap, okay, not one tap, but tap some Donus' head, putting us now in a 4v3 scenario. A bit of a precarious scenario now for Deviant because they've got Dumfries inside of Laundry who's looking to barge his way on in and get the defuse stuck down, but there's no tangible way for the rest of his squad to cover him unless they're actually right there next to him, and that's what needs to be done next. Magpie drops in down below. It looks like this is going to be just an aggressive dive bomb into the objective, and when we see Dobbs rather isolated and alone in the covers here, this plant's going to go down. Yes, it is! Deviant find themselves in a post-plant situation, and Dumfries gets in the action, finds two! Kovacs there to collect one, and Scipio, just like that, is the last man standing! And against three in a post-plant situation, you begin to wonder, is Deviant going to clutch this one out? And yes, they do! Round six slides in favor your attacking side, meaning they move into the second split of this matchup with that uh, ever-coveted two-round advantage. Very well played from Deviant, of course, making their debut as a side here today, and a great showing from them so far, going against Imperial of Man, them who, from last season, were one of the big one of the big gunner teams, one of the dangerous teams that persisted in that top four, so this could be a massive result. I'm still trying to piece together exactly how Deviant were able to stick that plant down over by the, um, over by the couches next to the record player. And I have a sneaking suspicion as to do with the fact that the wall that is shared with the dining room and the laundry side was completely left soft. Yep. As you can see, there were holes down there, meaning that, 
Well, the A bomb site is not really a safe place for the defense to actually play in. And Yukio, he had the right idea of actually re-peaking this particular angle to try to get the jump on them, but it was simply read into by the side of Kovac. And if, for example, IOM had actually reinforced that wall, then guess what? You would have actually been forcing utility out on the side of Deviant, but then, you know, those Selmos, they can only create holes that are about yay big, so you still have a little bit of wiggle room as the defense, but... I, I, I see the idea that IOM were trying to exhibit with that particular strategy, but playing from inside of Memorial isn't really the go-to, because it is also a very, very exposed room down below. It is susceptible to a vault in through uh, the window where the bicycle is. That is shared with the red staircase, as well as simply from down below in the main hallway. It is a very tricky position to play inside of that Memorial stage. And then to sort of peer in as well to the bomb site to laundry and shut down any plans. It's it's not really a tangible strategy, but that's all in the past. Deviant, they're going to be starting off on the defense this time around as they have moved their way on up to AVG by the looks of it. Oh no, wait, it's trophy actually. Yeah. Yeah, it's trophy. Yeah. They're not going to go for the the normal default site rotation at least. And while the dobs going to be picking kicking up that Flores, and on a site like this, you might be able to have a significant impact with him, but. Dumfries, on that mute, that is something to keep your eye on because, yeah. well, it's going to be so disruptive. You cannot get your RCXDs around them, you can't jump them over, and the radius of them even stops that detonation if you try and prime it before you enter the range. I was a Twitch drone, I believe, you saying farewell to life as Yukio is going to lose one of those vital bits of utility, but Cute Machine finds the opening killed around and. Where was that from? An interesting shot, mm. lands it deep, and that's going to be waving goodbye to Sandanos, and, well, that's your lesion gone, so those goo mines that generate every single few, or every few minutes, well, they're no longer a factor in this, only the ones that were pre-placed. Which is a bit rough, and naturally, you know, those goo mines, they no longer deal damage on contact, it takes a couple of seconds before the damage actually does start to ramp on up, but the audio keys is why it's so important. Uh, so IOM, they're actually not willing to lose any kind of precious time whatsoever as Magpie has now been spotted over by Zombie itself. SPAC is able to shut down Hench, so that is the refrag that they were indeed looking for, and I believe that also has taken IOM's Heart Breach utility out of commission. They don't have any trampolines, no can openers, no nada, so they're gonna have to do this the good old-fashioned way. Dob is able to start us off by finding Dumfries as well instead of Astro, and now Kovac, well, he's left to his own devices as he's force the scamper away back even deeper into AVG. SPAC and Magpie, they're holding onto the bomb site with an iron fist, but I believe that it may start to soon crumble and slip between their fingertips. Toxic Babe engulfs the master bedroom doors. The diffuser has been left outside on the balcony, funnily enough. And Yukio, already inside, is able to shut down Magpie. Finds the second as well onto Kovac as they locked horns. And just like that, before SPAC even had the chance to react whatsoever, he was taken out of commission. That was an extremely strong round on the side of IOM, but it more so looked like just a tad bit of uncertainty and... I hate using this word, but just a bit of cluelessness on the side of Deviant. I, I think IOM somewhat hit them with a strategy they just didn't or weren't able to provide an answer with. And here among them, just every time Deviant tried to fire back, they had an answer. And that was just complete control and dominance. And you got to remember, and here among them are a strong side. Majority of this team is cowering forward from Season 2. So there is that level of cohesion. There is that level of awareness. And... You know, there are very potent gunners on this side. Scipio was a great example of that. Yukio in this matchup as well has been popping off. So it is going to be a difficult task for Deviant to hold on, even on the defensive side. But once again, see that Flores being brought out. And I really am interested to see how impactful uh, we will see these drones be, considering we're up against that Mute Mobsy combination. So it's going to be very difficult to get them in the key positions. And when you get them in the key positions, you still have to actively worry about a single bullet destroying that precious bundle of high explosive. Hmm. And not only that, by the way, it's not only the Rotero drones that are going to be suffering from the Mute, mute Mobsy combo, it's also those Twitch drones. 
So this is um this is gonna play out very very interestingly because Deviant they naturally know that IOM are not only gonna be using all of this gadgetry to their advantage to well gain information but also with a sense of lethality whether it be for players themselves or actual defensive gadgetry it is gonna be countered outright and IOM know very very well that they can't necessarily let their utility do the talking as they once would have imagined until they deal with those pests and those mute jammers which is just another more sort of layered layer that they have to deal with. I don't know why I said layer twice, but it was the only thing that came to mind. Double but still. layer. Double stacked. Yeah, double stacked. It's just a lot of different things that IOM have to worry about for the time being if they really want to be as efficient as possible with their util. I mean, that, that really is one of the keys. And this is actual, well, think, thinking of efficiency. Easy but as. Yeah, that was probably the cleanest, the most efficient, and the safest way to ever remove the player on 90. Have a drone, sing mm -hmm. the drone hole by Wolf, and don't even need to crack open that window. Well played from Cute Machine on that repel, and look at the amount of control this now opens up. All of classical, all of landing, that's essentially free real estate. You, all you must worry about is to swing from this main sort of position, and uh, well, Hench... Not aware for it, and no one's there for that immediate retrade, so we're gonna find ourselves now in a 4 versus 4. A minute 50 remains, lots of time, and while well, this mute has seemingly no chill, gets aggressive once again, takes two drones to the Shadow Realm with him, and, well, cuts away that utility. Makes information even harder to establish, and Cute Machine, well, makes it even harder to hold ground. Finds a second kill in this round, and pressure begins to mount down towards his main bar. Dumfries has to reposition, look for a new way to take this fight, but his team begins to fall around him as the dog finds one of the magpie, and a four versus two left to go. Pressure boiling on this powder cake around him. That's going to be from study the main push of this forms up as Dumfries takes explosive damage down below the impacts of Zafia, working their way through that flooring. Makes it an uncomfortable job just to sit and persist. Lots of time to work with, but that's going to work oh. in both ways. As Yukio doesn't need more than a millisecond of that F2 to send a boy to the Shadow Realm. And Zafia grabs that final kill as that mute falls. And now, the advantage that Deviant won't held in this series is now gone. Imperial of Mountain them have tied it up four rounds apiece. And well, momentum is a massive factor, and I think they may have found some again as they swap sides. Indeed, that does look to be the case, and naturally on the side of Deviant, they are arguably on what is now known as the least or the less favored side, so it's going to be extraordinarily difficult for them to try to string rounds together, but all they really have to do is replicate the exact same scoreline as their opposition in the first half. If they are able to secure two rounds, then we're likely going to go to overtime as well. But aside from that, let's focus on how gorgeous this kill is. The information was so perfect, and this was actually Cute Machine self-droning themselves in. The yellow ping came out natively, and so did the rounds. That was absolutely you love beautiful. You love to see it. You I also want to, to rewind to that, Don't Freeze, on the SMG-11. A wonderful spray transfer to find both those drones, you know? True. You, get, you know, they're small, hard to hit targets, a wonderful transfer, pop, pop, and they both went, you know, both got broken. At the exact same time, that's the, that's always going to be the kind of thing, it's like, damn, I wish I could spray transfer like that onto actual players, not, you I know, know the drones. It's so sad when it happens, I know. <laughs> Yikyo making a very <sighs> critical call out there in all chat, must have tased someone with that twinch drone, because going 99 HP, someone's tied up for one, so a free assist on the scoreline. That's going to help the coast later on when that gets calculated. So, we move on to round number nine. Action just phase begins. <laughs> just imagine how much of a nightmare it would be to have to calculate ADR in this game like CSGO from all sources. It would be oh horrendous. Oh my lord. It would be bad. I want to see it though. It would be bad. I, for wh out. whoever ever makes if that ever gets made uh, via like an overlay or something, I, I feel sorry for whoever has to make that work, because that would yeah. be a nightmare. Mm -hmm. Hey, what else is going to be a nightmare? Be. This Monty. An, Im an impenetrable wall of steel can walk up and take map control for essentially free, but it's going to be mm. met by a pretty significant puzzle, and that's going to be the main stairs, as Dumfries has that shotgun and that C4, the drone accompanying is removed, and the SMG-11 pulled out to help <laughs> cover off in case anyone pushes deep instead of study, but no one's on an op for that, and... Then Malmonte's gonna creep up, take control of those main stairs, force for a lot of damage though, loses half HP as Scipio finds the opening kill, what is goodbye to Sandanos, is Mike Pie. Well, very far away from sight on that echo being risky. 
perhaps losing their life early can be massively detrimental, but Dumfries down below in a great position. If no one knows they're here, this could be wonderful and just Ooh. can't see the player close to that main door. How about the oh. drone? Go spot him out, and that's going to be Scipio finding a second kill in this round. Indeed. I was about to say that, you know, it would have been entirely possible for... Um, Kovac to have also been shut down if there was a player over by the study window, but we're long past that point and we're starting to actually, well, approach the point of no return for Deviant either. IOM, they've actually committed to executing onto the B bomb site right here, baiting out smoke, uh, smoke babes as well as yokai shots for the time being. Keep in mind that those are on a cooldown as well, so. For the time being, IOM, they're just trying to soak in as much utility as possible to make the execution that much easier later on. But Hench, he's actually had a change of heart, tucks himself in behind the vault door as he plants the defuse, and he can do this all day, quite literally. There are 50 seconds left, and all he has to let happen is for his teammates to pick up the kills. It's as simple as you could imagine. Magpie now left in a 1v none as he has been taken out of commission. IOM were absolutely ruthless, and once again, they're starting to actually shine even brighter than Deviant on their attacks because of how much more ruthless they can be on those roam clears as well. We saw how easily dealt with two players were on the side of Deviant and how easily Iowan were able to actually convert that into then a situation where they only and solely had to focus on the bomb site itself. Iowan, they're, they're, they're finally starting to let their true colors show, I feel like. Yeah, and this is what exactly what you want to see. And Pimp Man them were such a strong side last season. Again, they're carrying forward a lot of the same players, and they're showing exactly why they were a demon to be messed with. But Deviant, still, it's not over for them yet. The momentum is with IOM. We can't dispute that. We can't dress it up any nicer than it no. is. But they're on the defense. They know that they can take rounds away from Pyramid of Man. Then they know in terms of mechanics and gunfights, they can stand toe-to-toe -to -toe and win them fairly as well. So mm -hmm. there is that still momentum swing. If they can break that down now, if they move the trophy and statue, they'll put themselves in a great position to bounce back once things are all tied up, moving into round number 11. But to get to that stage, they need to win now, they need to get this round, otherwise, of course, they do risk IOM grabbing that wonderful, prestigious match point advantage. And that yep. is not something you want to give your opposition on the very first play day of a season. Mm -mm. No. I mean, winning out a single round to tie things up is going to be extraordinarily tough. Winning out two to guarantee yourself at least the one point by essentially just showing out your hand and saying that overtime is an opportunity it's going to be even much more difficult to accomplish but it was about at this stage as well where iom were able to pick up their first round keep in mind in the first half deviant they won three rounds in a row before they were able to visit trophy and finally take their first defense that might be the exact same tale that we see right here with deviant we're already three rounds into the second half deviant they're opting to well revisit trophy for the second time if history is to repeat itself, then Deviant are likely to take this round all to themselves and tie things up. But naturally, IOM have been on quite the roll. It's going to be difficult for them to, uh, you know, sort of alleviate the tension off the pedal and start giving this even less gas. Oh, when in doubt, flat out, and Scipio is certainly not in doubt. A Spax first to fall, and that's going to be a massive blow for Deviant. You're losing your Goya worldly. That's going to be waving goodbye to a C4, but Sandanos is there to get a trade. Not in that golden three-second window, but still relatively close to stop major damage being done. And this is going to be Kovac in a very dangerous position now, fighting with a pixel angle around the Goyo shield. But a single impact at this stage will be enough to burn that away and force that position out. And yes, the Roni is a great weapon. It's a stable platform to fight from. But at range like this, you need to be supremely accurate. As the Dob seemingly gets aggressive concussions used. And there's the grenade. Oh. And it lands perfectly. Oh, Scipio. A nade of dreams perfectly soars through the sky. And that M67 sends that sends Kovac to the Shadow Realm. Mike Pie fires back and gets one as E4 tossed up and lands close to Dob but finds no damage. The repel threat is active as well as Dumfries is under so much pressure right now. Has to make a fight stick and do some damage to the RCXDs. Blow away the cover at that desk and pressure begins to mount from inside this bathroom as that's going to be the major front line forming. Keep an eye though. Yukio cutting off this astral window but decides I'm going to move off. Rotate downstairs and perhaps even push up the staircase later, relying on their teammates to hold this angle and Dob doing a supreme job of doing so. Vaults in by 
my bicycle, and well, this could be the opportunity mm. as it all finds that kill. I heard the Mosborg shoot up in the distance, but clearly not enough at 40 seconds remain, and time ticks away, but player count more critical. My pie finds one, finds oh. two, needs to make it three, has no more cover around the desk, and falls in the DBNO. It's all down the Yukio, but the C4 oh. lands, and Deerian tie us up five rounds apiece. Oh, my heart was thumping the last couple of seconds right over there. It came far too close. I genuinely thought that IOM would have been able to close it off the moment that they shut down the player over by Astro Staircase. But then, in comes Magpie. And, he, you know, on a normal day, he would have been at the mercy of that 416's recoil. But he was able to pick up two kills in quick succession like I had not seen in a long time since the last patch. And that was the saving grace for for Deviant in that scenario right there, effectively shutting down any and all presence that was being exerted over by Astro in one fell swoop. And then he decided to overstay his welcome, which, you know what, I can't really blame him. He could have potentially dropped down the hatch, but he wanted to continue to be the primary beachhead for the, the, the offense to deal with. That was a lovely need to kick things off on the side of CPO. Really, really well placed. And here's the play. Two peaks, two headshots, and then Yukio comes in for the cleanup. And then a 1v1 scenario, but as Yukio went in for the re-peak, they didn't realize that they had a boatload of explosives so that stood right at their feet. I mean, that was a wonderful play. Truly wonderful from Mike Pai to say and play in such an exposed position with that level of composure. The win those fights one after another narrowly misses out on that very, very clean and rapid succession three piece, but does the damage, delays the time, and gets their team the win with support from that aforementioned C4. Mm -hmm. So, five rounds apiece. Winner takes this, goes to match point, has that then advantage, remembering that we do have overtime going in over to overtime. Gives both teams points to Victor takes two. The loser takes a single solitary one out of it for, for, for you know, for at least dragging it out past round yeah. number 12. And I do like this system. It does give an incentive to push deeper into the later rounds. And we're certainly getting close to them here for a first match of this play day. Round 11 to go and the Montine getting brought out yet again. So likely Dobbs going to try and force that up the main stairs and be a direct pressure point for everyone trying to hold that position deep inside a study. And I would keep your eye on this, because everything's somewhat right now. Lines up for a study push. The mozzie pest inside of that drone hole stops the direct information. And Scipio, once again, with that grenade, opens thing up, things up. And from below as well, I believe. Yep. Perfect. Absolutely perfect. A wonderful throw. A wonderful toss. And now map control. Well, that falls to the side of Imperium of Mandem, and they can mm. just creep up and take control. They have to worry about positions like landing, but again, Montine is great at taking it. It can stand menacingly and just distract and be that potent active threat. And keep in mind, uh, Deepin, they can also con they can contest the Montane as well. They just have to actually narrow the gap and then force them to stagger by. Uh, well, I, I, I want to say slapping their shield, let's leave it at that. But it's a very, very difficult task to accomplish to outright deal with a Monty unless you've got a C4 from down below. Or you potentially got Kovac who's just tapping heads once again. Yukio is the next to fall and now Kovac finds himself staring into the soul of that Montane, which I can tell you is not a very pleasant sight whatsoever because the dob can just relay information 24-7 and at the right moment, when you make a mistake, that Montane is going to come creeping ever closer towards you. That could have been now as well. The dob could have really realistically actually worked his way inside of games, but continuously he decides to, uh, well, call out even more information. But here comes the wide swing from Dumfries. He's able to find one onto Cube before finally being taken out himself. A lovely refrag on the side of Scipio to not let matters to get all too out of hand. And now, IOM have only two players to deal with. Kovac, who's currently stuck inside a vault, and Magpie at the top of red, who's contesting the long angle. And that is an angle that... If you're in the shoes of IOM, you may want to think twice about contesting against that 416C. 35 seconds left in the daub. He's on the bomb site itself, and Scipio, he's all clear to plant. Well, he's going to... Well, the plant's not going to get down. Denied by Hench, but this is just so much pressure mounting. Sorry, I cracked myself. The plant does go down. Down, Magpie has to battle away with Montaigne, daring, bearing them down. And, well, Scipio is to collect that final kill. That Montaigne, well... Key to success there, blocking off lines of sight, being potent, and a wonderful execution on the AVG. Once again, kind of reinforcing the points we made earlier on broadcast, yep. saying that this site isn't exactly leaving uh, a lot on the board anymore. It's pretty easy to break down an attacking side, and while Imperium Mandem showed exactly how versatile you can do it. 
Maybe other games, though. Being selected again from the side of Deviant. Well, they're going to uh. try for it, and... I mean, listen. You're going to yeah. a site, you're expecting your opposition to perhaps do something similar. And judging by their operator lineup, it does seem that IOM are going to be doing something reasonably close to Montaigne getting brought out again. Yu yep. is going to be dropping out towards a new operator, six picking away. And while we have a wonderful stop being brought out here, it's you know, one defensive win on the Aviator Games to six attacking victories on it. The numbers aren't exactly with the Avian right now. You know? No. No. It's a. They aren't pretty rough it, it's it's it not it's not ideal <laughs> deal but again that's you know the confidence in strategy to bring out this right you knowing exactly that it's not been going well for either team of course so that stat line does come across everything not just the one team of course and it does seem like an extension towards aviator or towards master bedroom is getting brought out but again the direct presence from iom has what's been causing the avian a lot of problems They've been yeah. pushing up from main stairs, being active from study, chewing open the walls in study, making the site itself uncomfortable. And this is like, I'm trying to wrap my round because they have not won this site yet on their defensive side. No, nope, they haven't. No. Nope. And this is something that I'm struggling to justify going here again because you're 0 3 right now on this site. You need uh, to. Yeah, you're 0 3, and uh, it could potentially be 0 4, which also does cost you the match. I think going downstairs or a trophy statue would have been better right now. I mean, now. ladies and gentlemen, look, you've essentially got all the proof that you need. You have seen this in the higher tiers of Pro League, EUL, NAL, even in CL, down to Nationals, and now here as well. AVG just simply isn't a viable site compared to what it once was. Now, thanks for coming to my TED Talk. Let's see if Deviant can actually shut me up and prove me wrong, because that's what I really want to see on their side. Mm -hmm. I want them to prove me wrong more than anything else. I mean, if you think about it, track record says, right, because we always have a caster curse problem. We say something and teams prove us wrong. We went, it's not a good idea. It's the, the numbers don't stand with them, so perhaps we're here to stand defiant. But they're obviously going to perhaps try his best to stop this defiance and nip it in the bud as that's Dumfries off the board early and that's going to be your mute C4 and the shotgun SMG combination no longer available. So not a great start from the side of Deviant, but again, mm -mm. they have the ability to morph the map in their control. They have positions they can hold and Yukio seemingly wants to get aggressive. Has Candela's to do so and a lot of my, my ammo in that magazine to make it work. And I think this is going to be an explosive conclusion to this matchup, of course. That's if IOM get the method they want to work. Charging in is going to be Yukio deep inside of sight. And that was a wonderful transition just to get map control. Hold that crossfire as Cute Machine gets into the action. Is That's going to be Kovac falling. The Montana Hench as well grabbing that map control. A mounting pressure as that wall is chewed open. Cute Machine finds the second. Magpie falls and well, it's going to be a wonderful Ooh. shot there from Spec to get one back at least. Has those smoke grenades to choke out this push towards Sunny but look at that time with a minute left to work with. You can't delay every single second available. Sandanos gets an escape route. And that's Yukio, though. Fires off the LMG as back falls. And now it's all down to Mozzie. Last, last man standing finds one. Yes, the Fuser, though, might have an opportunity now. But the prone player by the pool oh. table is enough to close it out. And Premier Mandem find their very first victory in Season 3 at University All-Stars. And they do it on the opening play day for them. A wonderful start for them. But Deviant... Hold your head up high from that one because you had a great showing against one of the strongest teams in this season. So, a great opening matchup, but we still have one more to go. Indeed, we do. I actually really want to take a moment to discuss exactly what was working so, so damn well on the side of IOM. You know what's one thing that I actually picked up on? And I feel like it was the sort of main ingredient that worked in towards their success. It's kind of like that really, really old meta that I'm reminiscing about that we would use to see back in year one, year two of Pro League, back when Oregon hadn't actually seen his own rework. And for those of you guys that actually missed what the meta and the overall climate was kind of looking like back then, you would use to play Montaigne with a revolver because his hip fire was just so broken, you could instantly tap heads, it was absolutely ridiculous. And on top of that, people were a tad bit inexperienced with how they have to deal with verticality, but they had really, really creative means, naturally cooking a grenade and then launching it up towards the ceiling and then kind of just letting it do its own thing and you get kills in case the information is good which is something that i saw iom do 
countless times throughout that particular uh, throughout that particular matchup, and uh, specifically once it was also caught on camera. I think it was either rounds number ten or eleven where Scipio kicked us off by getting one of those crucial frag grenades kills onto the classical hall that is shared with the main staircase as well. So even though IOM are playing a very very sort of uh, sort of like an old guard state of siege right now with a little bit of new and fresh slapped on into it It's been working out tremendously for them, especially on a villa I love the introduction of Montaigne because it's not an operator that we see all too often Given that he has been practically nerfed into the ground by our lords and saviors over at UB But they managed to make it work everything that they managed to bring out on the side of the offense It worked and it put on a good show for us. It certainly didn't I mean mm -hmm. they were playing an interesting style of siege and yeah. I, I, again, very old school, you know, you're seeing reminiscent par parts from metas long gone, but it worked out for them. They were playing very yeah. well around that. The biggest thing that I have to say is that I think Imperium mm -hmm. of Mandem knew when to give up on sites a little bit better in the defense, and that's one thing, as we kind of wrap up this map of discussion a little mm -hmm. bit, is the fact that they went to Aviator Games so many times consistently, yeah. and didn't mix it up and they kept losing rounds on that site mm -hmm. again i understand confidence that you on you know you feel confident that what you're bringing will work you yeah. feel confident and comfortable in all the core positions and how the mm. you know fundamentals of that site work but when your opposition have taken that ma uh, that site three times against you already on that half yeah mix it up go downstairs you've got you know living mm -hmm. room can be viable with the correct setup if you dare wish or you could go for yeah. the easier tertiary side of going to dining you have options you have choices you, you do. don't need to pigeonhole yourself mm -hmm. onto one side to make it work and that's pretty much the biggest glaring fault that i can see it and is. you know going yeah. back and uh, involved review they'll see that they can work on it and i do mm -hmm. think for deviant there's good things to come from them this season they are certainly a yeah. team that will improve mm -hmm. over the course of this you know i believe nine weeks yeah, I think so as well, and especially if they do at a certain point in the near future decide to revisit Villa, then they obviously know for a fact not to uh, visit AVG, or at the very least like make it their primary bomb site, considering the fact that they're 0 for 4 on it thus far. And that's not necessarily their fault as well. The, bo the bomb site itself has well, not a whole lot of leeway in terms of overall destructibility. There's not much that you can do with the bomb site that's vastly different. Take a look at Trophy, for example. That bomb site also has the exact same age as uh, AVG, but guess what? A year and a half to two years in, we actually saw the closet extension with Castle finally take place. So there is still room for creativity. I just don't feel like it's actually on AVG at this in this day and age anymore. It's just a bit rough, but naturally, I do think that in the next couple of weeks, we will see teams sway away from that bomb site and start exploring new ones on Villa. At least that's what I hope is going to happen. Certainly so. What a great showing from both teams. Of course, IOM take the victory 7-5 in our very first matchup of the evening. Yep. But we will be throwing to, I believe, a short little break where we get everything mm -hmm. primed and ready for our second matchup of the evening, which will also be just as exciting as I will have to check my schedule here, actually. Yeah, I, I can fill you in on that one. No worries. Next Thank up, you. we have got Poggy Woggy, or um, if you'd like to throw in some extra syllables there, Poggly Woggly. They're going to be going up against <laughs> Team 9 as well in our next and final matchup for the first week. So, don't touch that browser because we're going to be back in just a couple of minutes to close off week number one. See you in a few.
And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to our final matchup for week number one, play day two. Naturally, right ahead of us, over the horizon, we have got Poggy Woggy going up against Team 9. Two more fresh new faces, faces, yes, I can speak the English, from none other than the current draft system that we actually have lined up right here in Badass University All-Stars season number three. So... I myself am really, really excited to see exactly how these two teams are going to perform. I pray to the Lord in heaven so we don't return to Villa because I don't want to experience the exact same kind of nightmares. But regardless, it should definitely be a matchup. In case if you guys are just tuning in and you missed out on the first matchup that we just that just took place a tad bit earlier, IOM they were able to close it off seven to five against T, uh, against the Deviants, seven to five on Villa. It was good. It was a good showing from both squads in the sense that they show their strengths but also a lot of their weaknesses so they do know exactly what their homework is moving into the rest of the season that we have lined up in stock but naturally this next matchup it is the conclusion the last bit of action that you will get in week number one until next week monday and it's good it certainly will be again we're going to be getting to see you know two t new brand new team names go up uh, mm. face to face a lot of recognizable names if you have your you know vision on side of the uk scene as or even the university scene as well so i will keep your eye on that one because this is looking very interesting but before we discuss our rosters before we see who is in the battleground let's see what our battleground will be what map will we be going to and well as you mentioned to us we don't want to be oregon we've had enough of it chalet goes bye bye instantaneously you know Ouch. part of my heart goes part of my heart dies i wanted to go to the wonderful chalet resort but no it's coastlines next to go so we won't be raving our way off in ibiza villa consulate are next to be waved goodbye and well this is scary oregon's still available will it make the cut as we see our next two to get banned out i'm hoping we're gonna be something a little spicy but no it's gonna be cafe clubhouse or last two to get banned out uh, that means oregon of course will be defaulted as our decider meaning we're yep. gonna be going to oregon so we all know how Oregon plays. Every yep. single person should know how this map is played. It is a fundamental map. It is linear by design, and that's why teams love it. It's so easy to play. It doesn't mm -hmm. require, you know, diving in and being a super strat-heavy team because those super or uh, strat-oriented teams inside T1, you know, doesn't look too different from your regular games, you know, day in, oh. day out. So it's why mm -hmm. it's so popular. So I wouldn't be too surprised. Mm -hmm. No. Usually when it, it comes to Oregon, the devil is always going to be in the details itself. That's why a lot of teams, they will just stick with the standardized strategies that they know they can execute well. But at the exact same time, there is always the risk that your opposition is going to know exactly what you're doing as well. And that kind of is the dynamic that we always see on Oregon. It's extremely predictable and that isn't necessarily a bad thing. It just usually means that because of the fact that it's a predictable map by architecture, that as a team, you have to plan one, if not two steps ahead of your opponent to gain the upper hand over them. That's usually how Oregon does pan out. And it has actually been a couple of weeks since I've casted this. So you know what? It's not the change of pace that I was looking for, but I can accept it. Yeah, okay, understandable. I, I've had a few weeks off as well, so I may as well dust off all of my Oregon lingo. So, Thatcher is first to be waved goodbye to, and well, to a surprise to no one, uh, that is at all. And the next is going to be Flores. Now, we did mention this on our very first map, discussing about how Oregon has changed when it was banned out previously, but... The Argentinian operator is very strong. You know, even with a mute mozzie combination on board, those drones can be very oppressive and clear away key areas of the map, such as elbows. So banning him out in the prep 
phase, or in the bad phase, I should say, is much easier than dealing with him in the live action rounds. We will be seeing our mirror wave goodbye to again, and while I know part of you feels pain every time your favourite Spaniard is left on the bleachers, so well, a moment of commiseration for that, but our fourth and final operator to not make the cut is going to be banned out by Poggy Woggy. Who will it be? I think it's going to be Kaid. Well, that's to be expected. Thatcher got yeah. banned out eventually down the line. You're going to need to ban up that Kaid. Jing and Yang of Siege. Jing and Yang of Oregon. You need that to happen for a fair ban phase. So, no hard breach of banned out because Flores does take up that mantle now. So, it's going to be much easier to breach through these walls. And I would expect Team 9 to bring out a Maverick. Probably. It is left on the table and it would make 100% sense to bring out Maverick. Not necessarily for... Well, dealing with hatches outright, but I'm specifically thinking about any other one of the walls that takes place, for example, over by Attic, Dining, what have you. Naturally, Maverick nowadays, and especially when you pair that hand in hand with a Thermite, you just use your Surrey Torch, you draw a little hole at the very, very top of a wall, you toss in a frag grenade so you uh, end up quite literally saying boom boom to a lot of those mute jammers and banded batteries and then you allow your thermite to place the exothermic charge and bada bing bada boom presto you've got yourself a gaping wall or a gaping hole inside of that wall it's relatively standardized we are going to be starting off on that top floor why are you chuckling right now <laughs> the old chat <laughs> just sledge the one with the big hammer oh got it hmm? just... <laughs> i thought i thought kyra was the one with the big hammer that is true, Cairo does have a replica version of the SI Hammer. Pretty cool. It is really cool. It is. I, I, wish... I would. Mm. I wish it was a real hammer. I might just go and buy myself a sledgehammer. It, it, I'm, a, you know. I'm actually curious. I'm going to have to ask Cairo what kind of material it's made out of. I believe it was 3D printed, so it's mm. one of those 3D printed polymer things. But still looks awesome. It does. Uh, yeah. Oh, Fabs finds that drill. Of course, a recognizable name on that new roster that made that appearance instead of Yukin 2. So, that is something to uh, notice. I'm pretty sure uh, the player that's actually on the sledge, I think that's pronounced Farsha, if I'm not mistaken. Oh. I'm trying to work this one out myself. Yeah, exactly, because I'm looking at the roster see sheets and it's just like, huh? Whenever I see an X in a name, it's always pretty bamboozling. And it if you're is. wondering why we're, we're, we're discussing player names, it's because we're in the opening stages of Oregon. And not a lot happens for the first 40 to 40 seconds to a minute because it's going to be droning out key areas. Getting core map control like top of uh, like T3, like classroom, setting up your verticality and initiating your core plan. Fabs is going to try and somewhat disrupt that rhythm, takes the fight early, but backs away, no damage done. So that was somewhat exciting, I guess, as that drone has been jammed out by the mutant side of, inside of classroom. So, again, yeah, this is going to be slow, methodical, exactly how Oregon's played. You need to get that wall open. It's a linear map. It's designed around breaching through these core choke points. So, we need to get that done. Clear that away, and we hear that impact to doing the job. So that's going to be, um... I'm going to have this, the tackling this name is going to be... It's going to be tough. For the time being, I think we're going to stick with Farsha. Probably Twitch chat is going to correct us on that sooner rather than later. One would assume. Twitch chat, help us out, you lovely bunch of hooligans. Regardless, though, Closet has indeed been opened up. Hide. He is currently sat within arm's distance of that Closet breach, but naturally in the opposite side of an indestructible wall. And now that he has been breached on out, he has to scamper away back to safety behind that deployable shield. He can still continue to make an impact from that particular position, which is going to be really, really good for when Team 9 do eventually want to give themselves the green light and go for the hit itself. But that isn't the only prong that is currently at work here. Attic has also just been controlled by Team 9, so they have two prongs to work with, but unfortunately enough, maybe not as many men. Aztec is the first to fall, and Vabs, he holds his ground like an absolute legend, shuts down Ainuv as well. And that ensures that Poggy Woggy are able to maintain the man advantage in this 4v3 scenario as the clock is starting to dawn upon them. 30 seconds left to go, and trust me boys, it's go time.
Maui finds one, Mr. Joe falls, a three versus three, but as you said, it's time to go. 25 seconds remain, so a dive bomb in the site necessary, and there was the lucky Oregon board bird giving us a flyover in above camera view. 15 seconds and time drains away, a rotation down the closet there, the hide finds one as James falls, and Vobs is there to collect another one, three in the round. It's all but over now, five seconds of start of the no man's land. Sledge finds one, can't find two or three, is probably Woggy claim round number one. One. A bit of a nightmare scenario for the likes of Team Nine to find themselves in, especially in the last couple of seconds when they just didn't anticipate Hyde to be on top of that dresser. Keep in mind, it is one of the most uh, one of the most predictable spots that you can actually play as a defender, just because of the fact that you have the high ground and naturally, in uh, the usual Star Wars canonical fashion, the Hyde, aka Obi Wan Skywalker, was able to outright deal with Mali. I believe it was, aka. Uh, Anakin Skywalker, so, uh, <laughs> relatively standard stuff on the side of Poggy, not all too much to write home about, but the one thing that I will say is that Vabs was easily the most influential operator. Picking up this first kill onto Aztec was already just absolutely outstanding, and you can see how iNoob was hungry, his jowls were practically salivating to try to get that refrag, but unfortunately enough, he wasn't quick enough to the draw, and just like that, Team 9 they had lost a lot of the gas that they should have had left in the tank. If that was, for example, a 4v3 scenario in their favor after being able to shut down Vaps, it, we could have seen an entirely different outcome. But that's all left in an alternate universe. For now, though, back to reality. Poggy Woggy, they have taken themselves the opening round, and it's up to Team 9 to see if they can draw things up. Well, this basement certainly presents a different array of challenges for Team 9. They have to, you know, commit to a certain execution style, and I do wonder what they're going to plan on doing. Bob's nose to the drone out there and understands and the value of information, so gets that out of the board very rapidly, and a good decision to remove that from play. Because mm -hmm. you know, one of the kind of those parts of Siege that people don't talk about a lot is how important that drone economy truly is. And well, with our wonderful reworked observation tools that we have, you do get a better indication for the number of drones still available. So every little account, so cutting them down, removing drones, super important. Because that's going to choke out that late round push and make that pressure mount and mount the deeper into the round you go. So it's still early days, you still have resources now, but... You know, 30 seconds down the line, 45 seconds down the line, that Gemini is going to be on cooldown, and some of those drones have been shot away, so every bit counts. And now we can see the Team 9, they're starting to work their way into the top floor, specifically over towards meeting, and you can assume that Mali is probably going to put one of those exothermic charges on the E-Box hatch to, well, claim that piece of control. And I believe they have indeed spotted out Vaps. He's stuck over by Small Tower, and now the intel and gunfire will definitely confirm that. And at this certain point, Vaps, you got to realize that you're on a suicide mission. The boys on the side of Team 9, they're going to be hunting down for you. But the longer you can persist and maybe even walk away with a kill, the better. He walks right into the LOS of a Gemini Replicator before finally losing his life to Farsh, and that happens 80 seconds in. So, that is still quite a bit of time wasted on the side of Team 9. Naturally, I think that Vaps could have gone away with an extra 10 seconds, and that would have been much more impactful, but hey, at the very least, you can give yourself a pat on the back for a job well done. No, job done, job established. Vaps is going to get traded out for that. So, 4 versus 4 to ensue. A minute 15 to work with. And on a map like Oregon, that's not a lot of time to get really anything achieved. It's a slow map, an arduous task, at anything cleared. And every inch can feel like taking a mile. Inside of Elbow is, well, is Mo, and well, he just has that for free. No pressure's being mounted and decides, yeah, Ooh. I think it's time to reinforce this off. Without any direct pressure, can do it for free. The Hyde gets into the action, drops that Yana, and that's going to information loss as well. Dropping down into electrical will be James. Well, he's got a great weapon to brawl with. Finds oh. more. Has to lock for more, though. Does he know the player's inside a closet? He's aware that Bandit might be an imminent threat and watches deep into this war towards his rotation. The peak from that lesion is there, at least he's throwing that green mine. His head's gonna surely be lost, but now he escapes with his life in tow. Mr. Joe finds one of the noob and the well, casualties keep rolling into Team 9. Maverick gets aggressive, but doesn't check deep mm. towards Freezer, and Aztec is left against three. At task indeed and only 19 seconds to work with can't even collect Oof. mr joe as poggy claim their second round in a row and joe even gets into the all chat the cement and play some mental warfare for that one as that is two rounds in a row but now 
Can they complete that flawless rotation? Can they win on a tertiary site as meeting and kitchen is what they bring out? And this can often be a controversial decision to go to a different site, but meeting has its strengths and values, and they can play it massively vertical, and I would imagine you keep your eyes peeled for that one, because that can present lots of problems for teams, and can Team 9 crack that puzzle? Only time can tell. Indeed, only time can tell. We do see iNoob flashing the Montane, but it's likely to be six picked off of, and naturally we will have Vabs actually stick the Aruni this time around. So, yet another one of the two architectural operators being brought out going in tandem with the castle. On the subject of last round, while we do have the replays on board, I genuinely thought that Team 9 actually had the jump on uh, on PW because of the fact that James found himself on the bomb site, basically just dropping down through Evox hatch and then closely tucking it behind the bomb chassis. I thought that that could have potentially been the lock pick too. well, open up the entire round for Team 9, but naturally a lot of what actually went wrong for Team 9 happened around the bomb site itself, specifically over towards Freezer and over towards Pillar. We didn't catch a whole lot of it on camera as well, sadly enough, but one can assume that the moment that Elbow was patched on up, a little bit prematurely in my opinion by PW, we had Team 9 make the call to then ingress towards the bomb site through pillars, down the staircase, and potentially even through Freezer. But it seems as if, well, PW, they had the contingency plan properly set up to deal with that. We saw that every single person, except for James and then finally Aztec, that were inside of the bomb site itself, were dealt with. And then it was basically easy pickings at that certain point for PW. It was really, really well played on their side of the defense. But now their skills are really going to be put to the test. As you said, we're moving to a tertiary bomb site. And because of the fact that it's not meeting in kitchen, it means that they have their work cut out for them. One player is already going to be spot on out over by Attic. That is the hide currently. And he does have a hatch to drop down through, but naturally, the wolf wall, it is entirely soft. Meaning that he's going to have to tuck himself in behind that kitchen work right over there and keep his life in tow for as long as possible. An interesting decision to bring the knock here. I'm not quite sure what value this operator does bring in well. None. Yep. Almost timed absolutely perfectly. Vabs runs up the main laundry stairs, finds that kill, and waves goodbye to Nook. So, I guess the grenades are certainly something that's brought by the Danish operator, but, well, no more in pocket. The first casualty to be suffered as I noob Ken's control of Attic, but are they aware the player deep inside of this position? Oh conquered up by that uh, pile of timber. It does seem that the height has actually yeah. fallen off, mm. yeah. This is actually a wonderful play and decision from him because they don't exactly mm -hmm. know if he has been cleared off. Verticality is getting done, so I think they are reasonably secure. I think it's confident that the all entirety of Attic has been oh. secured. As Mr. Joe from below finds that C4 kill on Inub. His moment, he stands still to check his drone. He's going to be no more as we only have a minute 17 left to work with. Maui looks for anything, an angle, a lifeline, a single position available to find a kill and a lifeline for their team. The impact, shoots through that dragon's tail wall, tries to get an angle, fighting from this lounge here, fighting from dining now, but so many angles across into walking through that doorway is surely going to be your demise, and with a minute left to go, your options are beginning to dwindle if you're in the camp of Team 9. Naturally, Team 9 can potentially get that wall open, but it doesn't really accomplish much either. It gives you an extra avenue to work with from the exact same corner of the map. Mali is going to open it up regardless, but they're left in the 2v5 scenario with little to no control working in their favor as closer. Dances with the devil as he's tossing in one of those goo mines and continues to go for the re-peak as well. A bit unnecessary, but at this certain point, when Team 9 are left with only 30 seconds left to work with, it becomes that much more desperate. Mali finds the first, but the cross angle held by Mo, it is absolutely bang on the money. Mali now, now left with half HP to work with and a boatload of heads to find. He finds the first though, so there goes the hide and now there's only three more to power on through. But unfortunately enough, dueling things out with the pepperoni, it is a very tall task indeed. And just like that, we have PW picking up a hat trick. Three rounds in a row. The one thing that I actually do want to digest before I quickly hand it back off to you is... The one play that we actually saw at the very, very top, we were obviously discussing the opening frag that was exhibited, I believe it was, by uh, by Mo at the time, as well as the hide. Now, the hide, he was stuck over by uh, the attic with almost nowhere to go. He couldn't even drop through the hatch because of the fact that Wolf was completely soft and there was an angle for Team 9 to use. But then up comes Mo, 
on the Aruni with the Pepperoni and is able to shut down one player before then dipping back into Armory. At that certain point, you have struck enough disarray into the attacking squad that they now have another headache to deal with, namely being that Aruni. That means that all of the attention was off of the hide, granting him the possibility to then drop back down through the attic hatch, which I thought was a very, very key, crucial, and awesome detail to pick on out. Keep in mind, at the start of the broadcast, or at the start of this matchup, I said that Oregon is a map where everything is standardized, but the devil lies in the details, and that was one of them. It's a wonderful way to describe this map, because everyone knows the core strategies. Everyone knows, okay, this will be open, this will be reinforced, we're likely to have players in X, Y, and Z, and it, it is, does come down to those small, minute details that you have to make on the fly, and that does really put weight and pressure on a team's IGL to make those correct decisions, all those individuals to think on their feet and in the fly at the moment, make something work. And while speaking of something that might be interesting, is addition of an Amaru. So, uh, yep. I think we're going to be looking at a uh, fast and aggressive shock in all style strategy from Team 9, and I am beginning to think, where will this Amaru go through? The obvious answer, okay, well, that, well there's the answer. I was going to say, the obvious answer is likely they're going to try and do a fast execution from that big window, and that's going to be the pressure relief valve in, the, in towards small bones. Turns out, mm -hmm. no. Getting control of TT very quickly and doing it rapidly to get that initial control, launch that as a stage and ground, get that control, open the wall, begin mounting your pressure. That Maverick's there to do so. Down below is Vavs, and that might be a massive moment. Creeping up those back tower stairs can be a massive detriment to the attacking side, and I don't think they know as yes. Well, they're looking straight for the opening, not watching their flank. Vavs, if you pick up the pace, you might be able to cause so much chaos, but no has backed up it, perhaps rattled and scared away via a drone, but it fights to live another day, goes down to the basement and might pop up somewhere else to be an active threat later in this round. I'm actually curious where the claim... Uh, uh, if you take a look on the side of Team 9, they have two claimers at their disposal, one in the back pocket of James and the other in uh, on Aztec, and none of them have been placed thus far. They don't have a Nomad out. Naturally, that spot went to the Amaru itself, which we have yet to see any proper impact from. But the fact that Team 9 haven't actually put up any kind of flank watch makes them that much more susceptible to it, specifically. It would be the prime opportunity for Vaps to strike, but he's waiting just for the right opening to do so. He's waiting for the moment when Team 9 are at most caught off guard. As they continue to just barrage a whole load of utility over towards the high, over towards the hide. Well, those uh, those ADSs they are still on cooldown, so they can be reset. He just has to wait a tad bit longer for it. Seventy seconds left, and we have yet to see any casualties on either side. Farsh on that Amaru is already up by the kid's window, looking to cross off any kind of angles over there and vaps down below. Is going to ensure that Attic is no longer a playable area. And in comes iNoob, and there he falls. Now Man Advantage sits firmly with Poggy Woggy. In a 5v3 scenario, Team 9, they're scraping at the bottom of the barrel for some kind of opportunity to strike. Yeah, well, they need to find something and find it fast. Time drains away, a player down, and this is going to look like dire straits for them on their attacking side. Maui tries to brunt force their way through, but Vabs has none of it, finds James. Mo gets into the action as well. Maui finds one, can't make it too. And Aztec, yet again, alone and isolated is the hide. Walks through the barrage of bullets, tanks it like a machine, and closes out this round four in a consecutive fashion. Wow, Poggy Woggy are very brutally strong on the defense side of Oregon, but again, defense yeah. weighted map, a difficult mm. situation to find yourself in. But they are playing sublime. They are really they are. playing it's perfectly. Great. They're not like they're playing Oregon the most efficient way possible. Every yeah. inch that they need to hold, they make it feel like a mile. Mm. Team Nine wanted to establish anything, they have to look over their shoulder. Is Vabs on a flank? Am I gonna die, gonna die to a C4 below? Nothing comes free. And it's a wonderful yeah. style of play. It's really punishing on a map like Oregon, and it's worked mm. out sublimely for them so far. Four rounds in a row. Can they make it fives to go downstairs to the basement? Second time of asking, and will it be a second time of victory? And then laundry. Last time around, we saw Team 9 actually show some really, really good signs of life on their basement attack, and it specifically had to do with the fact that James found himself on the bomb side really, really early on and was able to shut down the smoke, which is one of the key anchors on the side of PW. 
and that was already the exact kind of start the team nine were looking for but unfortunately it just kind of collapsed right in front of them because of the fact that the surrounding players that were pushing down potentially through freezer as well as the back staircase they were just picked off one by one now once again i've got my eye on vabs as science stated out he is an absolute menace currently top fragging in the server and while we're on the subject of vabs just quickly for those of you guys that actually missed what happened last round there were two players on side of team nine inside of attic naturally we had farsh as well as james who i believe was on the uh, on the maverick and after the attic wall was opened el maru had actually rotated off to the kids window so there's only one player inside of attic and well, they fell prey over towards Vaps, meaning that any and all pressure those being exerted from that point was entirely alleviated and Poggy Woggy only had a couple of different avenues to work with. Now, onto the basement though, it's going to be a, that much more difficult for Vaps to have proper impact just because of the fact that it is a very turtle-esque kind of bomb site. but I do see a blue silhouette somewhere off inside of the main lobby. Could that potentially be Vaps? Indeed it is. Not much of a surprise there, Vabs looks to be aggressive and really cement that position as that's born in the constant side of Team 9 and has done so a wonderful job as of now, being one of those key instruments to leading them to this 4-0 uh, round advantage they currently hold. Maui uh -oh. finds the opening kill via exothermic charge, an interesting one, but I guess you'll have to take it. I noob in a nasty fight via that freezer doorway, but ultimately succumbs to the MPX, and that's not going to be an ideal situation. Mo gets in the action as well. That's going to be a trade-off as you lose your Amaru. Aztec above fighting on this stage position, but again, you've cleared off so little, have so little map control. Can you really punch electrical and Ewok safely at this position? Aztec sends some shots down range in Vab's directions. None connect, none even make him flinch, and he can just sit, persist, send more 9 mm down range and be a nuisance, be a thorn, burn away this time. Aztec knows he has to push Zulu, he knows the time is reliant on him making this effort happen as Vab takes a boatload of damage and finally retreats down towards the site. But with a minute five left to go, that roam presence may have already struck damage with Team 9. It has. Things are starting to look very uncomfortable for Team 9 right now. It's a 4v3 scenario, and sure they have some utility to work with, two smoke grenades, I believe two concussions, as well as one explosive in that Sophia lifeline. So, it's definitely doable. If they're able to find out Vabs, who is already in very low HP, they can even things up to a 3v3 scenario, but naturally, they have so much more to deal with. Lucky enough for them, Elbow has already been sealed back up, so that is one less avenue that they have to worry about, and I believe it may have also been breached thus far, or at the very least, Ebox has by those Selma charges. It looks as if Team 9 aren't willing to commit to Elbow whatsoever, which may have been the wrong call, but what can I say? Two players on the side of Team 9, they fall, and there goes the third. Vabs, I believe that was, if I'm not mistaken, a triple kill, and cleaning up the last two Ooh. players with the Deagle, that is simply just the cherry on top. Every single one of you people that play CSGO on a daily basis, eat your hearts out because you don't get this kind of action right there. A wonderful shot, not quite a one dig, he sends some follow up to confirm the kill, but that was plenty. And Poggy Woggy find themselves in a five round advantage moving into the sixth and final round of their defensive split. And they once again dawn meeting in kitchen. You gotta think at this stage, what answer does Team 9 have? What solution can they find, if any? Because this defense has been super strong and potent, and I don't think it's gonna be an easy job to break it down. And naturally, one would expect that when we actually move on to the tertiary bomb sites, that's when the attackers have the best shot at winning. If we were to follow that rule of thumb, then Team 9 would have ended off the split 4-2, to two, but we saw just how greatly they struggled with dealing with that top floor presence that PW were exerting last time around, it worked out to perfection. They were able to take not one, but I believe two casualties before finally retreating to the bomb site itself and helping the rest of the team reinforce that portion of the map. PW played it so exemplary to the point that Team 9 were scrambling for any kind of solutions and none came their way. This time around is going to be that much more difficult to actually do because well, they've already come across the Titan that is PW on this church area bomb site. You can definitely bet your bottom dollar that PW are going to do something that is equally, if not even more menacing than last time around. Specifically, 
PW have been able to keep Team 9 on their toes at each and every single turn, and Team 9, they struggle to find a response. I feel like this round isn't going to be an exception. I'm going to agree. I, I always want to be the optimist and, 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 and say, you know, I, I always think they can find and claw some fight back, but this defense has been... One of the most potent, one of the strongest, one of the most difficult to break down I've seen in Oregon in a long, long time. And again, Team 9 are doing the basics, they're doing the fundamental things, they're setting up to do them, but, you know, they're not being let. Foggy are just deciding, no, you're not getting a single inch, you're going to have to fight for everything. And the use of that secondary harbor too late to open up that hatch is just going to burn some time. I knew takes a lot of damage from below, I believe, a C4, and well, oh, oh yet again, almost in the same position as when that sledge died in the opening time around here, he's going to lose his life. That's your buck gone, and that's your soft destruction. James finds the player lurking inside of Attic, finds some damage, and actually takes more of his own. Now, scampering away will be that player, that Jaeger upstairs, and that's just going to be an active threat. You have to continually worry about, because I don't think the high is going to be dropping down anytime soon. I think he wants to take these fights. He wants He's going to persist. Pressure. He's going to persist because of the fact that Wolf is completely reinforced. The only way that Team 9 can actually contest them is if they are physically inside of Attic, which makes it that much more awkward to fight on out. The hide... He has the quote-unquote moral high ground in this scenario. He can choose to drop at any certain points, and the longer he persists, the more time it is off of Team 9's clock. But he's already fallen off, so now that is free real estate for Team 9. And luckily enough for them, they don't have to worry about any more explosives from down below, as all of the C4s on the side of PW have already been exhausted. But they have so many other things to worry about. Where the hell are all the defenders? They're currently hunkering down on bombsite. They're not revealing themselves. PW, they have the element of surprise. They are the unknown factor. And Mali loses their life almost, and the DBNO status can be picked up back to 20 HP, and that defuse can be recovered. But this is going to be difficult whichever way you slice it for Team 9 to try to pull out back into their favor. Farshot takes a boatload of damage, but trades some back over towards Mo. And with time draining away quite rapidly, Team 9, they have to make some kind of move. They've got to make a dive bomb. Drastic action required in that rotation down towards Kitchen and begins. James holds the verticality, but time, every valuable precious second ticks away, and you've got to make something happen. It's going to be a violent end of this round, and that's going to be Vabs starting us off. Maui falls, diffuser in hand. Vabs finds two, looks for three, but Joe gets into the action now, and it's going to be a wonderful collapse as the entrance to Kitchen becomes the gravestone for the attacking side, Team 9. Well, six rounds down, match point, Team Poggy Woggy. This is going to be a brutal feeling for Team 9, knowing a single mistake now ends your opening game of the season. And that's, uh, well, you don't want to get 7 0 so at least you got to fight for that. Get some rounds on the board to hold your heads up high and say you didn't go out and you weren't flawless. So they have something to fight for. That Vab's rocking the 2.31 rating as well as a near flawless cost. Naturally, the hide, he's been the player that has had the most impact thus far, not necessarily in outright frags, but just by simply existing and contributing each and every single round. I personally thought that the hide truly, sh I, I truly actually shined the brightest on those tertiary bomb sites because of the fact that he was tasked with the most crucial job there is. So hold on to the top floor and one. Other very, very interesting thing to pick out from PW's overall strategy is the fact that they were really, really quick to adapt to their own strategies and realize what went wrong and what could be done better. In the first uh, defense of meeting in Kitchen, they left Wolf completely soft. It meant that the Hyde could do his job, but not as easily. Then in the next roll around, they reinforced Wolf, and then look at that, the hide was actually the one that was rewarded with the opening frag of that particular round. I'm really, really loving a, everything that we're seeing from PW. There is nothing on their side that can disappoint me, and you know what, hopefully I don't cast or curse it now that I've said it, but I'm pretty sure that PW's overall success that they've had on the defense can firmly be translated to success on the attack as well. I think we might be in stock for our first flawless victory right here in Bulls Season 3. Uh, it's going to be difficult to bet against those odds. The second C4 being used for a rotation, so a lack of a shotgun perhaps hampering the setup of Team, of, 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 of team 9. 
Yeah. But, uh, I mean, they have good information. So they have a lot of setup. They have that mute mozzie com uh, combination, making it difficult for drones to exist, difficult for drones to gather this information later on. They have, again, that threat, the active threat of runouts available to them with cameras outside. The settlement charges, though, already opening up that closet wall, and that's a massive tick on that checklist established very early. Aztec tries, or at least thinks about something aggressively. You saw that Mr. Joe is very aware, very confidently knowing that there's an active threat for that run out. He might have even spotted the Valkyrie in their drone stage. And he's just going to bide his time, wait outside, and be that pesky person waiting for that jump out to arrive. As Vab's on that slide, makes progression, gains control of armory, checks deep, checks every corner and every active threat, and hops on that drone to gather critical information. Bowser is going to take a little bit of a drop damage, but not going to be too major, as they're going to be able to set up for control of Attic in a few seconds. Indeed they are. That Suri Torch has already done quite a bit of work over towards the Attic Breach, and is going to continue to do more, but I don't think that Hyde realize exactly, realizes exactly what's on the opposite end. There is a yellow pink coming on out, and he spots the head of James and lights him up so darn much to the point that James is only a single round away from certain death. And here comes Vaps. Surprisingly enough, he's inside of Attic and he manages to deal with two players outright before being traded himself. A boatload of chaos already being cost right over here, but somehow Team 9, they're able to thrive in it as Farsh cleans up Mr. Joe. And now here comes Aztec. He's got the upper hand. He's got the flank up. He's got two players right in front of him. Deals with the first as I noob in quick succession deals with the second. And just like that, when things got a bit too dramatic on the side of Team 9, they were able to remain cool, calm, and collective and deal with whatever PW threw at them. They are able to pick up their first round on the defense. Now they just need to do that five times over to guarantee themselves a point. Quite literally the, ev the definition of a uphill battle. It must be flawless yeah. from this stage on. You're not going to get 7 0 So at least you can say, okay, it was a rough game. We didn't get 7 0 well, you never know. I've seen crazier things than a 6-0 comeback on Oregon. So, Team 9. It wasn't a clear-cut, easy win round. They had to fight no. for it. And mm -hmm. they very, very much fought well for it. It was tooth and nail. It was scrappy. And it was a difficult task. You move to the basement. And, well, in theory, on paper, this site should be easier to get a defensive victory. They should prosper here more than they did upstairs. And again, just following on paper how Siege tends to work, this site's a little bit easier to get that defensive win than the upstairs is. The worrisome moment happens if they get this round victory. If they can get this and get their second round, you move to a tertiary site, and you just yep. gotta think there, that's when, you know, the red flags occur. That's when you gotta mm -hmm. be concerned. Can they hold on to that one? Because I certainly believe that they have very good potential to lock this they one do. out, to get the victory on the laundry. Next site, next uh, next objective, gonna be a little bit trickier mm -hmm. than that. But again, let's not think yeah. too far forward as Poggy Wog can certainly close it out right here, right now. It's gonna be an interesting round nonetheless. Mm hmm. I'm not exactly sure what the current kill record is for uh, season three of Bool. We naturally know that uh, during season two, it was what twenty three by Max D or twenty two. It must have been. It was in the. Tw it was certainly in the twenty. Uh, that it was. It was in the mid twenties, I think. <laughs> something along. Uh, something along that. But I think Vaps. He's on the verge of breaking the season three record thus far. Potentially just actually setting it, and then maybe Max will come back and wipe the floor with it. Who knows exactly how that's going to transpire, but. You can see the PW, they're making quick time thus far. They've already begun their descent over by the back staircase in Aztec. He's hunkered down over by Pillar itself. And trying to duel things out with the Sledge, none other than Vaps. It's going to be a tricky gunfight to win against that odd-looking holographic sight, but naturally because it's Vaps himself. I Noob is able to flush out the hide, engulfing him in Toxic Babe Gas, and also shuts him down with a couple quick rounds of that. 9mm SMG 11. Just like that, Defuse has been dropped on out in Team 9. They have the man advantage. Now they just gotta hold on to it because their life in this particular matchup of Oregon relies on it. 
Well, having the mind advantage and being able to burn away time is a great position to find yourself in with a minute 30 left to work with. Team 9, though, can't get over aggressive. They can't risk their advantage. They need to play wisely around it. And Vabs, well, you know how potent he can be. So a single opportunity, a single misplaced pixel of a head or a hitbox might be enough to spell the catalyst of an aggressive push, which could be the demise of their comeback attempt. Aztec, though, in a great position to battle for control of tower stairs, has to worry about bonkers. But I knew makes very short work of, Zo of Mo. They're a fantastic spray, an aggressive position with the SMG 11, and makes it work. Five versus three, and time begins to tick down. Aztec, though, rightfully vacated that corner by Harry Potter, stays alive, and now surely they're going to be able to det detect that Diffuser is alone and isolated by those barrels, meaning. For the side of Foggy Woggy, you've got to get aggressive. You've got to find the kills, yep. as is going to be able to find that pickup, get that Diffuser back in the hands of a friendly, but. Is it all too late? Is it a little bit too effort? Is this push gonna be. work? And I don't think it certainly is because that smoke cancer chokes him off. James finds one on the VOB, since a five versus two, 30 seconds remain. Team nine look on road to find their second round of the defense. Indeed they do. Closer may be able to walk away with the frag or just get fr outright fragged himself. Wasn't really expecting anything else, but thus far team nine have shown us exactly why and how they are so strong on this particular bomb side we saw that pw they had very to little actually dare i say absolutely no success with actually getting themselves on the bomb side whatsoever the majority of the players that fell they were over by the staircase outside of bunker and all of the action just happened in these two positions and we saw earlier in the first half that team nine they were able to get themselves on the bomb site despite having lost out the rounds numerous times this time around pw weren't given a single inch to work with and i absolutely love that that sort of it's kind of like that bouncer mentality i want to say on the side of team nine you're not getting in no one's getting in that's about it that's about where it stops so i really really love that performance and showing from them so do I, I really am rooting for them now, because again, you gotta think, mentally, being six rounds down is a pretty tough place to find some energy to battle back with. Finding two yeah. rounds in a row, great for them, and a flawless mm -hmm. one on their laundry defense. I mentioned, the laundry is pretty easy, or well, at least on paper, an easier sight to get. Now, it's this, tertiary time. this is where it's make or break for Team 9. Can you defend? Can you hold on to your tertiary site? They've opted for dining and kitchen. A different variant than what we saw Foggy Woggy do. So you've got to look at this and go, okay, different strategy, different site. How are they going to play it? And doesn't look like they're going to go for much upstairs commitment. I think there's going to be a lateral hold as we see the Valkyrie of James trying yeah. to find the perfect pristine spot for that camera to provide as much information as possible as this round plays out. So this is mission critical. This truly is, it is. mission critical team nine. If they can get this uh, victory here, they set themselves up for another two sites. They know they can beat Foggy Woggy on. And that makes this a deep water, dangerous game for both teams if team nine can find success and build upon their momentum. The one thing that I will say is that PW, they should be relatively well versed on these tertiary bomb sites as well. For example, on their defense, they started off extremely strong, but they closed off their second visit to meeting and kitchen flawlessly. The results had only actually gotten better with each and every single defense that PW had to show us. Now that the shoe's on the other foot, I really can't be confident in anything that I actually say because this is uncharted territory. As you said, this is the first time that we are seeing kitchen and dining be played out between these two squads it's an unknown factor and on the subject of this top floor presence well it's going to be outright dealt with that mu jammer that is over by the main wall is soon to be disposed of as well as that black eye camera i was actually starting to think maybe team nine could have opted to contest this by for example throwing up a frost or an ella up there with a shield but that's not going to happen also another interesting thing team nine aren't contesting showers whatsoever there is no maestro in place so how this is exactly going to work out, how this composition uh, is going to complement things, Vaps. I don't know. But Vaps, yeah. Vaps is just in, fighting Aztec, and I have a feeling 
He's gonna do his best impression of Joe from Yukim, but no, shot down rather rapidly by Maui, but Hyde gets into the action, and finds one, finds two. The advantage now sits strongly with Poggy. They're gonna get this plant down. Yes, they are. So a post-plant situation. Oh, no! no! Oh, a C4 in the last milliseconds of the plant buys Team 9 a lifeline. The window's been cracked by the boss, but I knew falls. Well, it's all down the mozzie against three. Now it's a post-plant situation. Tracers through the wall. A desperate grab with RP-10 Roni. Great for brawling, but better is the G36C. And that's going to be Mr. Joe collecting that final kill. As we see Poggy Woggy claim a 7-2 victory. We knew it was going to be an uphill battle for Team Nime, and trust me, they did try their little hearts out, especially in those opening two defensive rounds of theirs, but naturally, we did speculate that once it came to the tertiary bomb sites, things would get extraordinarily rough, and rough they did get indeed. But regardless, huge congratulations over towards Poggy Woggy for finding their first win of the season thus far and actually more importantly so it has been thus far the most dominating victory that we have seen because every single score line has been seven to four seven to four seven to three and now seven to five with iom and deviance this is the shortest matchup that we have had on paper in bull season three thus far yeah the least number of rounds required so far in a season to grab themselves a victory and I believe because of that round difference, that will put them in that number one spot at the end yep. of week number one. So an exciting and exhilarating couple of play days. Mm -hmm. And I really have to say, there's a lot of promise for these teams. Boggy Woggy coming yep. out of the gates absolutely swinging and showing mm -hmm. exactly how strong they are. And Vabs putting a statement out, showing their class and ability. The moment you give mm -hmm. a pixel for that man to shoot at, you're gonna, he's going to send you to the grave. And again, True. you look back at a previous matchup, two other teams, and Premier of Mandem and uh, oh no, oh brain, please don't forget. Deviants. Deep, thank you. It's it, every once a game finishes, my brain tends to forget half half the information Same I here. need. But Deviant again against the of Mandem showed a fantastic mm -hmm. showing in their opening matchup. So a lot of yeah. potential as this season plays out, as these teams improve and mm -hmm. keep your eye on teams like Boggy Woggy and Imperium of Mandem and the key players like Valves because I have a feeling that kill record set last season might not last too much longer. Nah, probably not. I mean, it's going to be a really, really tall task for Vaps to try to break 26 that was laid out by Max D last season. It's definitely doable, but I'm pretty sure that Vaps has already set the current record for Season 3. So, how much did... Uh, if one of uh, if someone from production, either Science or Noah, can confirm how many kills Vaps ended it off with, I'm pretty sure it was in the ballpark of 17 or 18. So, folks... That is going to be technically your new um, your new foundation, your new testing ground. That is the number that you have to break in the next couple of weeks. Seems doable, and it is indeed 16. So 16 is the number to beat by the looks of it. Certainly so, but that does wrap up all of our action for today. That was our final game, and that's not only the final game of the day, that's the final game of week number one of season three. And well, if all these results are something to keep your eye on, I think season three might be one of our most exciting ones yet. So, yeah. I think from everyone here in the, in the virtual caster desk and in the production cupboard, that's it for this stream. Thanks for watching. Thanks, Tudo, for being a wonderful co-caster joining me in the Virtual Caster Desk. What a way to break my two-week hiatus from casting to be back um, with my favorite duo. So, from everyone here at the Badass University All-Stars, we bid you farewell and good night.